to shoot off and, and uh, good. Because, you know, there's a lot of, and Jack covered earlier on today that the um, different microcontrollers that are available. And I think um, they all require PC development tools. But the nice thing about this is you can just plug it into a PC and start typing away on it. AB8NO asks what insulation against the cold is being used. The insulation is the pink polystyrene material that you see there in the uh, video. Um, it's an open question also whether larger amounts of insulation would allow it to transmit for longer because it would keep the battery for warm, warm for longer. And so there's a lot of things to uh, develop further. Dave New, any success in getting extended whisper protocol standardized? Um, it's, there are lots of people who have subsequently developed versions of the whisper telemetry uh, protocol that I developed, and they're all slightly different. It did gain acceptance on the WhisperNet uh, website because there's a checkbox at the bottom where you can exclude from the maps if you have a balloon telemetry. And there's also um, a Whisper Challenge web page that excludes the balloon uh, type of balloon reports. So I don't know whether we would ever have a standard that everyone adopts or not. Um, Dave knew any other applications that come to mind for U4B other than ballooning. I think U4B, I mean, U4B B with QDOF on it has the capability to uh, know its position. It can read sensors. It can read GPIO pins. It can transmit in many different modes, not just Whisper, and, uh, but also CW, RITI, QRFS modes, all the things that the U3 can do. And so there are many applications that I think probably do exist for remote telemetry that could be using the U4B. And WA5BDU, are there always ground, receiving, ground stations receiving data even in the most remote locations for the flight? Yes, there are. Historically, when we mainly used 30 meters, there used to be a bit of a hole over, uh, we, we used to call it the stands hole over Pakistan, Afghanistan, all of the countries with stands in the name at the end there in, in that region um, where we didn't get, normally we used to get a few reports per day, but it wasn't a very continuous coverage. With 20 meters, the coverage appears to be a lot better. And Whisper is such a powerful high signal to noise ratio mode that you can, you know, we had a reception long path from New Zealand, for example, while one of the balloons was over New Europe, and that's a 22,000 kilometer journey. And so it's a really powerful mode. Uh, WA0 ITP, why did you choose the altitude? The best, is it the best chance of circumnavigation? You're trying to get above the weather. And as soon as you get 11 or 12,000 meters, you are above most of the weather. Not always, but at least you get above most of the water, most of the weather. Dennis Terrible has a question about the wire of the antenna and if it's insulated wire. Dave knows the answer to this. Dave, could you answer that? Yeah, sure. The, the wire is very, very thin. It's 42 gauge, so very, very fragile. <clears throat> but to make it strong, I um, string um, Dyneema fishing line, which is very thin, about a four pound test, uh, in the hallway upstairs. And then I get the wire, which is uh, the 42 gauge, and I string it parallel to the Dyneema. And then I go along with um, green contact cement and I uh, wipe, put it between my fingers and wipe it on either end of the uh, antenna and spots every foot apart. And that makes it really strong. Now it, it'll take uh, that, that wire, which will break just by sneezing on it. It now takes four pounds of force to break it. And uh, it has been quite robust in uh, connecting the balloon to the radio. Okay, thank you, Dave and Hans. This was a, a fascinating presentation. Uh, I know we have some more questions, but we'll uh, have some time this evening to get to those. Dave, uh, what I will do, I will, I, will, I will type the answers into the chat um, so that I can I can answer those questions, uh, some of those things. Oh, fantastic. In the next few minutes. And I, you know, it'll be three o'clock for me here, but I will try to wake up for the evening session and join that. <laughs> Uh, thanks. We'll we'll 
get out a few more door prizes here. Uh, Noga QRP, North Georgia Group, donates a QCX40 to EI2JP, Ron Hahn. MFJ has stepped forward. Uh, they're always a big supporter of QRP. They donate a 40 meter cub transceiver to Patrick Brewer, VE3KJQ. A 566P Micromorse Key to K9GCS, Jim Broyles. And an 1899T Walkabout Antenna to KD8TPO, Malcolm Lunn. Okay, uh, we're ready to start our next presentation. Um, a fellow who is almost synonymous with QRP. Um, I've been following him for the longest time, Dave Benson, K1SWL. Uh, I can't remember ever seeing him uh, at Dayton or uh, FDM, but by virtue of uh, his remote location and Zoom, he's with us this year. So. And here we go. Hello, everybody. Hi, Dave, and thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, let's see. And I believe we had a video to start with. And by the way, Dave, uh, I'm not certain that uh, I have been to Dayton in nearly 20 years. So perhaps our uh, tenure there never overlapped. Uh, would that be the case? Um, I had a little hiatus uh, when my kids were much younger. I really started back in earnest about 15 years ago, uh, but I had attended up through about 1990. So yeah, we might have overlapped, but not by much. No, I think I was there from uh, 95 until about 2000, maybe a little after that. Uh, I was looking forward to uh, returning this, uh, well, last spring actually, and uh, then once again this year, and uh, for obvious reasons, it, it just didn't happen. Well, it's great to have you amongst us this year. It's quite an honor. Uh, shall we start your presentation? Yeah, go for it, Dave. Okay. of Small Wonder Labs, a uh, manufacturer of QRP kits. That was over uh, the interval from 1996 to 2017. Of course, I still keep my hand in with home brewing, uh, and I'd like to share a recent project with you. Uh, first, let's uh, go to screen share, and I'll announce the topic of, the, of this presentation and show you what we've been up to lately. Topic of my talk, of course, is anatomy of a transceiver. Thoughts on the better mousetrap. Uh, more recently, uh, here at home, uh, my industrial empire shrunk from an office space of 12 by 15 feet to something a little more modest. Uh, this is now the workbench. Uh, it's in an upstairs room and space for projects is quite limited. You see a digital storage scope, spectrum analyzer, and computer there. Uh, I want to assure you that uh, this is not messy. Uh, if this were messy, uh, you'd know it. Uh, anyway, it suffices. One of the changes that happened, of course, was that it wasn't convenient to take coaxes uh, out of the space, uh, out a window. Uh, there's a power line coming in. As a result, uh, I gained more shack space. This shack is actually over our small barn, and it really is not much more than a closet. It's about five feet wide, so the, uh, the room stops or ends just off the left end of the workbench here. Also, I was standing as far back as I possibly could uh, without bumping into uh, other stuff within the facility. 
the lighting is great during the day. That's a, a north facing skylight overhead. And the coaxes go uh, down and to the right. There are two uh, video bulkheads, F connectors uh, that take the coaxes out. They go through the eaves and then out to the antennas. There was some spelunking involved there under the eaves. The uh, lamp incidentally is a steampunk style. Uh, it was made by an artisan about five miles from here. He used to be an electronics engineer and uh, probably thinks better of the, of the chains over to uh, building steampunk lamps. Most recently, in fact, um, most of the way through 2020, uh, I was working on a project called the Phaser, uh, a simple digital mode transceiver. Uh, I did the design work for it. As the next slide illustrates, uh, this is a three to four watt transceiver, uh, uniquely on the transmit side, uh, it used phasing single sideband. In practice, the opposite carrier, or excuse me, opposite sideband suppression was on the order of 35 dB. Really pretty good for such a simple uh, set of phasing circuitry. It was available with two pre-programmed frequencies, uh, FT8 and also the JS8 mode. And that second frequency was user reprogrammable. Uh, there were two push buttons on the board and the uh, frequency could actually be entered in uh, in Morse code fashion. Currently, the phaser is on hold for two reasons. Uh, first off, the uh, critical SI5351 uh, synthesizer IC is unavailable this year or uh, unaffordably so. Uh, there was apparently a serious fire at the foundry uh, and they're rebuilding, they're rebuilding the facility. Uh, however, it won't be back online until later this year. Uh, the second factor on that, uh, frankly, was fatigue. Uh, after about 1,300 of these shipped for the 17 uh, through 80 meter bands, and just under 100 for a different version of the 15 and 10 meter phaser, uh, fatigue was really a factor. So it's on holiday. If anyone is interested in uh, building these phasers uh, component by component, uh, there's ample documentation on the website, uh, midnightdesignsolutions.com. And Craig Johnson, AA0ZZ, uh, generously offered to supply the critical pick for this project. Once my involvement with the phaser tapered back, uh, I was of course casting about for uh, an ambitious homebrew project. And I set myself a number of goals. They're listed here on this slide. Uh, I wanted to ensure that I had good audio and plenty of it. Uh, the project also added an LED display, uh, the serial type. I put a fair amount of effort in on uh, smooth break-in. Uh, it also uh, was important to me that the side tone sounded good, and it does. Uh, finally, and, and pretty obviously, I needed a, a QRP gallon, the whole five watts. I met most of those goals, not all of them, and there were some setbacks along the way. Uh, I will uh, talk about them and, and share some of the saga at least. I built the project uh, largely with printed circuit boards. Uh, each board was a standard size. Uh, I did do some breadboarding along the way. Uh, this first board was the front end board for the receiver. And from left to, to right, you can see a, a tuned circuit uh, just to its right uh, is a MIMIC, an NAR3. Uh, MIMIC stands for monolithic microwave IC. Uh, and into a diode ring mixer, 
pretty close to the center of the board uh, with some filtering for uh, a digital local oscillator coming in. Uh, to its right, another uh, mimic. Uh, I ended up uh, bypassing that uh, during this construction. And after that, uh, a discrete broadband amp with a gain of about 20 dB. Uh, that particular package proved to be overkill. Uh, I've now uh, shrunk it down considerably at, at this point. The second board I built uh, was a phasing uh, IF uh, block. Uh, it used a, uh, a scheme first uh, published in uh, engineering methods for RF design, EM, RFD, excellent volume uh, available from AROL. It's uh, a first edition with minor reprintings. Uh, it's somewhat long in the tooth, but it's still very solid material. Passed through several types of filtering with an analog approach. It's uh, low pass filters uh, followed by a phase shifter. Uh, basically, the, these two phase shift blocks end up with uh, two audio components that are 180 degrees apart. And when combined over here on the right, what comes out is single sideband audio. I'll illustrate the first approach to this. And this was the analog approach out of uh, engineering methods volume. There's an adjustment pot here several low pass filters. These big things here are 3.3 uh, millihenry RF chokes and behind them a trifiler toroid used to split the incoming signal into two components. This worked wonderfully uh, up to a point. Right here you'll see uh, in the back center uh, you'll see an adjustment trimmer uh, that's necessary to phase up the two low pass filters accurately. These days, it's hard to get uh, high value trimmers, at, at least in uh, small dimensions. Anyway, uh, I had trouble adjusting this. I couldn't really tell if tweaking the trimmer uh, was making things better or worse. Part of the problem there is that the uh, that you're looking at a nulled signal to begin with. It's very small. Uh, and it's only a few millivolts uh, on a scope. Uh, that was superseded by a uh, quadrature sampling detector approach. Uh, this was popularized uh, by Dan Taylor. Uh, the approach was used in the NorCal 2030. As you can see from the picture, uh, there's a lot less stuff on this board. Same adjustment pot, it's used to do the nulling. Uh, and this is a four to one in, in the back center of the figure. This, this is a four to one uh, demultiplexer. The white things are, are capacitors and uh, they're sick together. This circuit samples and holds uh, samples at, uh, at four times the uh, incoming signal rate. There's a combiner here. And from there, it's just uh, audio amplifiers. This is the phasing filter section. Uh, combining is done somewhere down, somewhere down in here. These jumpers here on the right center uh, are used to select either upper or lower side band. The, uh, this approach worked very well. Uh, as measured, I was able to get 50, that's five zero, dB of opposite sideband suppression. And it was just spooky uh, to be able to watch a large input signal on the scope. Coming out of this board, I'd see several volts of audio uh, from a signal generator as it passed through zero B. On the other side, uh, there was virtually nothing on the scope uh, until up at about one and a half kilohertz. That's the point at which the uh, filter itself uh, was no longer registering the uh, at the two signal components accurately. 
here's something cool you can do uh, with an oscilloscope with an XY mode. Uh, I'm calling this fun with Lissajou figures. The output of the two uh, audio filtering channels, uh, those two outputs are 90 degrees out of phase. As a result, if you put them up on a scope in XY mode, you get a circle. Uh, if it doesn't work, you get, well, typically tilted ellipses. If the uh, signal waveform uh, applied to the receiver varies in amplitude, then what you get is a circle that appears to breathe in and out. Uh, if you apply a more complex pattern to it, uh, then you get uh, concentric figures. It's uh, really kind of interesting under the right circumstances. And I'm going to stop this. As I said, uh, this approach worked very well, but there was an unfortunate instance uh, after I had it constructed and working so nicely. Uh, I managed to apply uh, reverse polarity DC power to it. It, uh, it continued to work after a fashion, but uh, was extremely noisy, uh, just totally unacceptable. I wound up replacing two instrumentation amps uh, on this board as a Hail Mary kind of approach. Uh, that didn't do the job. And those ICs, by the way, cost $9 a piece. They were probably overkill, uh, but I wanted to make sure it was right. At that point, uh, I knew when I was licked on the phasing approach and moved on to something a little more conventional. Third time's the charm. Uh, this is a conventional IF board. And you see a, an attenuator on the left, uh, matching uh, network and three crystal filter, and then uh, back down to, uh, down to 50 ohms. Again, the discrete broadband amp uh, between the crystal filter and the eight pin uh, dip I see on the right. Again, about 20 dB of gain. The, uh, the right-hand side is the uh, familiar SA602 uh, or 612, uh, and it does a pretty good job for that application. Since I mentioned the topic of filtering, uh, I wanted to digress a little bit and talk about filtering and its impact on uh, received quality. This is an example of an audio active filter with smooth characteristics uh, on the left hand figure. You see it, it has a nice smooth curve. Uh, the downside with it is that it's a pretty slow roll off. Uh, in other words, you'd need a, quite a few of, of such stages to, to uh, end up with a sharp filter with some good qualities. I'll talk about those qualities. On the right is the phase delay as a function of frequency. The uh, cutoff frequency is right around here. This picture corresponds to the same frequencies as the one on the left. That's a good filter uh, in terms of distortion. Uh, it's not quite as uh, good if you want sharp filtering, as I mentioned. The next slide shows what happens uh, if you go for sharp filtering. Here's a filter with good roll-off characteristics. In fact, there's actually about 3 dB of peaking in there. And from there, it will roll off uh, more quickly than with the previous slides filter. The, uh, this tool, by the way, it is from Analog Devices Incorporated. And the tool is called Analog Filter Wizard. Very useful. Uh, on the right, uh, this peaked curve is actually the uh, phase delay for that very same filter. Uh, what this does is this high phase delay also corresponds to uh, some ringing and uh, long, well, ringing covers it, long fall times. The result is that the waveform is 
busier. Uh, you'll hear more stuff uh, in the audio. It's like putting a, a, a drinking glass or a seashell up to your ear. It's just tiring. Uh, quite, uh, here's why I mentioned this uh, with respect to that crystal filter. There's an example of a crystal filter uh, in the uh, engineering methods volume. Uh, for an eighth order filter, uh, if it's not visible on, uh, clearly on your screens, there's a curve that looks very nice for gain. It, it goes up, it's got rounded shoulders uh, at the edges of the pass band. The fly in the ointment, of course, is the group delay. It comes up as well, whoops. There's a horn, a spike here in group delay, and then back down. And again, at the other uh, corner of the filter skirt, it peaks up again. Uh, the, uh, this group delay at the edges was some 10 milliseconds uh, uh, in the case of this filter. Uh, the author remarked that uh, this was very busy and would probably be uh, quite unsuitable for use in a receiver. I'm back now, I'm gonna take a pause. Okay, I'm back after pouring myself a well-earned cup of coffee and it's not just any cup. Uh, at least from my viewpoint, it's uh, backwards, but no matter. Up until now, uh, this homebrew transceiver project has been uh, pretty much conventional, uh, at least when I got done messing things up. The audio section uh, illustrated here is where most of the good stuff happens in this design. Uh, you'll see four numbered bullets here. Uh, the first one is simply a cascade of audio filters and they're following the rules that uh, I'd mentioned earlier for, for filtering. Uh, none of them exhibits a, a sharp roll off. Uh, as such, they, they produce pretty good audio. There's several pulls of high pass filtering uh, at around 400 Hertz, and then about a half dozen uh, additional pulls of low pass filtering at, at, at least at, at last count. Um, the gain block, uh, is, is very straightforward. It's done with an op amp and it's about 40 dB of gain there. The mute function uh, warrants a little additional discussion. The, uh, the way the muting is done is with a series FET. And typically what we see in QRP transceivers is a gate to source resistor. And from the gate to ground, there's often a sizable cap uh, capacitor that is that didn't work here. Um, because of the way I've got the gain distributed, the signal being applied to that muting FET uh, is anywhere up to six volts or more uh, peak to peak. The uh, capacitor on the gate of the muting FET can't change very often. And what, what was happening was that the, uh, the switch was coming out of cutoff and distorting uh, rather badly. I ended up throwing the capacitor away uh, and it, it reappeared later. Uh, and I'll discuss that uh, in a moment. Uh, I see I have two different uh, blocks labeled three, uh, c'est la vie. The, uh, the side tone is a sine wave oscillator. It's done with three RC networks. Uh, each of them contributes about uh, 60 degrees of phase shift. Here's what it looks like coming out of the receiver. This is going to the speaker. It's about a volt peak to peak, uh, although uh, it could be pretty much any level you choose. Uh, that gain was, was set with a resistor. Interestingly, the, uh, this oscillator, the side tone oscillator, runs uh, 
nearly all the time. Uh, it's keyed on and off by a control line from the controller IC. Uh, if I didn't do that, uh, it would show up as a faint whine in the background. Uh, that whine is down 55 to 60 dB, maybe a little more uh, between uh, keyed side tone and not side tone. It got annoying uh, and I added a, uh, a timeout function to shut it off. The, the issue at hand there was that the oscillator was taking about 15, 15 milliseconds to start up to full strength and the result sounded uh, very soft. I won't say youpy, but uh, that's a good word for it. Uh, on to the next picture here. The, uh, the audio amp is the stuff that's at the near left side of the board. Uh, it's really uh, a fairly potent amplifier. The whole audio chain runs uh, on a nominal five volts and there's an adjustment pot there. The, uh, this amplifier itself uh, also runs with a five volt input. It's an op amp and a complementary pair uh, trio of resistors and some big honking resist, uh, excuse me, capacitors uh, out at the output end of it. The audio amplifier is capable of uh, just a little under three quarters of a watt uh, and that's into an eight ohm speaker. It's more than loud enough. Uh, this component here in the near center is a 10-volt low dropout regulator. That might not be adequate for a field, uh, um, you know, a field application, excuse me. Uh, however, it's intended for use in the shack and uh, it's perfectly good. It uh, typically drops out at only a half a volt of overhead. The, uh, back to the adjustment pot for a moment. Uh, the pot is there because uh, offsets can build up in this fairly long chain of, of audio stages. The, uh, the trick to making smooth and successful uh, break-in is not having any electrolytic capacitors uh, in the signal chain. This cap, uh, excuse me, this resistor uh, nulls any offset. The, uh, the DC component, the DC voltage applied to this audio amplifier is the same whether the muting FET is open or closed. Uh, there's nothing to shift. In other words, it's a, it's a constant voltage applied to this amplifier. As such, it, it required uh, an adjustment. The uh, controls, various controls over here uh, simply come over from the uh, controller and, and uh, transmitter board. Let's go to the next slide. Surprise. I was surprised anyway. A um, couple of key points here. Quality audio does put a premium on filter design. You want to avoid uh, sharp roll-offs. It's, it's kind of a case of no free lunch. Um, you can make real narrow filters, uh, but at this point, I really can't recommend it. My own impression, and it's strictly a matter of personal preference, is that good side tone is worth the investment in the higher parts count. It was probably uh, eight or nine parts uh, to get that sinusoidal oscillator. Uh, typically in a QRP rig, it's done with a square wave out of the controller, uh, typically run through a single uh, RC network. At least for me, I've found that I have trouble tuning in another signal. In other words, uh, matching my frequency uh, to that of someone calling CQ. Uh, this really took care of it nicely. And uh, I can pretty much zero right in on somebody and they don't have to use RIT RIT uh, to be able to work me. Yeah, also, uh, good break-in uh, is quite possible with this approach. 
uh, the audio amplifier, the final amplifier, runs a unity gain. And as such, any artifacts that do come through the audio chain aren't magnified uh, by having to charge through electrolytic capacitors. Uh, could it be better? Of course it could be better. Uh, here's a kit that uh, looks promising uh, and a version of this particular IC uh, was included in the, uh, the NorCal 2030. This was a matter of independent uh, evolution, uh, as I found out about the second time a friend told me, hey, that looks like what the, uh, the NorCal rig does. So, uh, so be it. Here we are. This is a Maxim uh, low-pass filter IC. This one illustrated here is the Max 294, and the left-hand curve uh, is pretty darn impressive. Uh, it has a cutoff need, very sharp, and the frequency response is down 60 dB, only 25% above the cutoff. Uh, you just can't beat that. Uh, I had looked at this uh, uh, as a breadboard, and uh, I was I was impressed with it. Uh, I had a had a uh, keyed sinusoid or a burst sinusoid going into it. And I saw no anomalies when the uh, input signal was uh, suddenly applied to this filter. I also wondered about phase response on it. And what you see in the right-hand figure is, well, phase response. Um, as you can see it, the uh, phase increases with frequency. The cutoff is right about in here. If you looked at it in terms of time instead of phase, you'd see that the uh, uh, time or temporal response uh, is pretty close to flat across the passband. That's a good sign. Um, at some point, I'll probably incorporate it into this uh, ongoing design. There is one caution with these. Uh, and that is that this works by clocking uh, a digital signal at either 50 or 100 times the uh, cutoff frequency. And that, that depends on the device. There's a max 297 as well, and its characteristics and its clocking are a little different as well. Um, that, that caution only pertains to having an extra digital signal floating around in the analog. Uh, you don't want it uh, getting through and causing problems in the audio chain. Other than that, it looked like a good device. This was the controller I see, uh, the last one I built uh, in this uh, homebrewing effort. It uh, really derives from the uh, Hilltopper design for the four state QRP group. Uh, that was a uh, transceiver measuring about four inches square and three quarters of an inch high. Uh, that was a, a no wires design, uh, the enclosure uh, from David Kripe and M0S. Uh, it was quite popular. There were a couple of hundred of them produced. Uh, and uh, very well suited for summits on the air work. Uh, what you see here on the right is a 28 pin IC. It's the Atmega 328P. Uh, it's the IC used in the uh, Arduino Uno R3. And to its left, the, the blue object is a Adafruit uh, SI5351 board. Uh, that amounted to laziness on my part. Uh, although I can, I'm able to solder the SI5351 with a lot of magnification. I don't enjoy it. Uh, the, the other factor in this is that this design also uh, supports a serial LED interface. The, uh, the crux of it is that the SI5351 needs uh, 3.3 volts. It's got a maximum of 
four point something volts, but the serial LED expects uh, five volts. What would have been involved there, in addition to uh, soldering that teensy IC, would have been in adding uh, level translation uh, out to the uh, out to the LED and also in from the uh, uh, rotary encoder. The rotary encoder itself uh, is a high quality item uh, that was lying around in my junk box, 128 pulses per revolution, and it's just silky smooth. Uh, at present, I have the uh, frequency step set at 50 hertz. What that lets me do is tune somebody adequately closely, uh, yet uh, yields about six revolution per turn on the tuning knob. Uh, as you can probably see that, uh, well, let me step back a bit. Over to the left end uh, is a pass transistor and basically the same configuration as was used for a transmitter on the hilltopper. Uh, three BS170 uh, MOSFETs in parallel, a, a small binocular core. It's actually doing an impedance step. Uh, and the uh, low pass filter toroids are behind it. You'll see that I'm using SMAs here, and I'd, I'd like to comment on that as well. They're small, uh, they're very convenient. Okay, that slide just illustrates uh, all those things that I just mentioned. And I can now move on to the actual build of the uh, project itself. When I had started, when I had started, I wanted to use a shielded enclosure. This is a uh, die cast uh, bud or Pomona box. Uh, I wound up putting a couple of SMA bulkheads on it, as well as a, a barrier strip uh, for bringing audio and control signals in and out of it. Also just visible on the left end of it was a feed-through capacitor for DC power. Uh, that proved to be extremely fragile. Uh, this was a surplus item at, a, at uh, a bargain price, and I managed to break two of them. Uh, it's affixed to the enclosure uh, by a 440 thread uh, uh, bushing and nut. Uh, it proved very fragile. Uh, I broke the uh, broke the wire leads off, and uh, I wasn't going to go back and do it again. Uh, this entire approach, whoops. this time shown with the uh, boards stacked in the enclosure, proved to be overkill. Uh, I wasn't hearing anything either in or out of the enclosure, out of this enclosure, uh, that warranted uh, that kind of treatment. The other thing that became painfully apparent was that it was uh, kind of vexing uh, to assemble this. There are three boards in the stack. The the RF board, uh, the IF board, and then this audio board on top. The, uh, the difficulty, of course, came in putting one board in, uh, providing flying wires up to the next layer, uh, and so on. The uh, next uh, slide took this a step further. This is shown with the, uh, with the, uh, three boards in the, in the die cast box, and finally the controller. Uh, and you can see a couple of SMA interconnects. Um, this is indeed a breadboard uh, in, in the uh, richest sense of the term. Uh, at this point, uh, I was able to receive signals and uh, I was uh, connecting up with uh, the rotary encoder so that I could tune around uh, and listen to it. Uh, for the reasons of uh, the difficulty in assembling it, uh, I dropped back uh, to what's probably a more traditional breadboard. This is shown with uh, three of the four boards uh, on a uh, 
a nice piece of quarter inch maple veneer plywood. And uh, only the controller is missing at this point. You can see it, the, uh, the holes for it there in the figure. I believe at this point I was using a, a DDS based signal generator uh, to provide the, uh, the local oscillator. And there were some flying wires uh, plugged into the uh, various headers on the boards to bring out uh, audio, for instance. To, to elaborate a little more on the SMA connectors, they may be unfamiliar to, uh, to folks. Uh, there's no reason to be afraid of them. Uh, they're not that expensive. Uh, this shows a close-up uh, of the uh, connector arrangement bringing RF in and out of a cabinet. The uh, UHF connector is a bulkhead feed-through type uh, and the bracket associated with it. They're both available from dxengineering.com. Uh, no commercial motive here, uh, just a happy customer. And uh, they have a wide assortment of, of stuff, both rigs and antennas. The uh, SMA connectors and cables themselves and the adapters tend to be frightfully expensive uh, if you're ordering them stateside. I'm listing eBay there as a source, uh, preferably with uh, a supplier here in the US from eBay. The adapter fitting. Uh, that's on the back of the, uh, the bracket you see there. Uh, came as a uh, pack of five of them. It, it converts UHF to SMA. I think they were $11 shipped uh, for a set of five of them. So you know, it's $2.20 a piece. The uh, SMA cables were about the same, 11 or $12 for a set of five six-inch cables. and other links are available. I think I've seen them up to 36 inches. Uh, at least I gave up at that point. Uh, they make them longer, uh, not interested. Anyway, my experience with bringing uh, RF signals off printed circuit boards in particular was that things like uh, twist and pair or even RG174 would always break after a while. Uh, and then you'd have a mess on your hands trying to remove the, uh, the old coax and uh, solder some new stuff in. I'm gonna stop the sharing here for a moment. Okay, I'm back after a couple of false starts here with the pause that refreshes. And we're gonna to go to share screen here. And I appreciate you bearing with me and uh, we'll get to the good stuff here shortly. One of the other goals I had with this project uh, that I hadn't mentioned up, up front uh, was my desire for uh, a nice packaging on this. Uh, what you see here is the front panel uh, of the transceiver. And from left to right, uh, headphone jack, uh, a speaker above it. Uh, it's about a two and a half inch speaker. And with the three quarters of a watt available from the audio, uh, it really fills the shack. To its right is a speed control. I insist on this uh, in, uh, in homebrew rigs. Uh, as with the uh, KX3 I'm fond of. Uh, I love having the speed control immediately available for CW speed on the front panel. Excuse me, no resorting to, uh, to going into menus. Gain, of course, is obvious. I don't remember where the knob came from. It's nice and big. Uh, I can actually put a fingertip on it uh, and, uh, and just tune through the band. Uh, with a fingertip, the uh, rotary encoder inside is uh, uh, very smooth and low torque. Uh, the key input to, is to its right. 
there's a row of switches here. Uh, FN just stands for function, still undefined. The uh, RIT push button could also be an XIT transmit uh, incremental tune for DX chasing and the step size. None of those is hooked up yet. Uh, I haven't yet missed them. The, uh, the display on the top right is a 16 by two. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's a serial LED uh, and it's red. Uh, I like red on my displays, I guess. Uh, I did have trouble at this phase of the project and took quite a, quite, quite a diversion uh, for a while. I discovered that the audio from the speaker uh, often sounded like it had uh, a rushing noise uh, behind it, but only when, uh, when a CW signal was coming in. I finally traced it to the uh, speaker itself. Uh, apparently, I've got things to learn about it, acoustics. At one point, I discovered that I could damp out that, uh, that rushing sound by reaching uh, into the speaker uh, in between the metal frame and the cone and putting my pinky gently uh, on the cone itself and the, uh, the offending artifact would simply disappear. Uh, so that was not an electronic issue. Uh, I also discovered, of course, that if I pushed harder, uh, the distortion got, came back and got worse. Uh, I've left that for now. I'm currently using uh, an external speaker. Uh, I think what's happening here is that the uh, speaker itself uh, probably works better in an enclosure uh, of its own, uh, something to provide some acoustic damping. Anyway, uh, on the road to solving this, I elected to eliminate the four individual boards and go with a single board. This is pretty darn busy. Uh, this measures five by seven inches and it's all there uh, on one board, which uh, really helps with troubleshooting, certainly a lot more so uh, than with the stack in the die cast box. I kept the uh, SMA connector for the RF input and output. What you see here is all four boards uh, from the prototypes combined onto a single board. Uh, I'm now in the process of shrinking it down. Some of the reason for that is that the parts count is very high. The, uh, the, the parts total is about 180 parts. Uh, that's just too darn many. I probably spent two to three days assembling this in uh, one fell swoop, and uh, I don't really want to do it again. Uh, it goes into, it has a newer shot of the, uh, of the transceiver itself. And uh, I've included this slide to show the, uh, the cabinet treatment. This is made of half inch oak, uh, I found a set of uh, dresser drawers uh, discarded along the road, brought the drawers home. Uh, they amounted to uh, many feet of this half inch oak. Uh, and I was able to rip about a seven inch width out of them. The, uh, the corners are, are uh, made with box joints. I've always wanted to do this. Uh, and it lends kind of a nice appearance. Uh, it was quite tricky to set this, uh, these joints up. Uh, there's a jig that does it. There are a number of products that do it. Uh, after only two or three days of frustration, uh, I was making nice box joints. It turned out that the, uh, the bottom panel on this cabinet isn't quite straight. Uh, if, if you go back to an earlier slide, you can see uh, small gaps in the, uh, at the corners. Those, in this picture, those are now filled. Uh, there are wood putties available for the popular uh, 
stain colors, uh, in this case, golden oak. And the stuff hides extremely well. Uh, for those of us who aren't perfect carpenters, uh, it does a wonderful job in, uh, in cleaning up. So uh, let's go back to full screen here. All right, um, you're probably thinking, wondering, how does it work? Uh, I had a lot of trouble attempting to get audio files uh, so I can describe it. And uh, hopefully I can append this uh, presentation later uh, with audio files uh, once I smarten up. The, uh, the rig itself does run the five watts. I've been extremely successful putting it on the air. Uh, I entered a recent contest, uh, the New England QSO party, uh, the weekend before last, and uh, made contacts there on 40 meters to the tune of 38 contacts. If I called somebody, uh, I always got through. There were no, uh, no uncompleted QSOs, which was a good sign. Uh, I had also uh, called somebody last night uh, he, he turned out to be a parks on the air station. For whatever reason, uh, I beat out two other callers to get through on the first try, which was kind of nice. The, uh, the most recent uh, QSO in my log uh, is with HA7, Hotel Alpha 7, Romeo Yankee. Uh, he too came back to me uh, after I had dropped my call sign in just once. And uh, I, on the recording, you can actually hear uh, that uh, he's saturating the receiver uh, at some point. So uh, again, plenty of audio and uh, very smooth operation. Uh, I hope to be on later in the day. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I will plan to, uh, to make schematics and description available to uh, to the ARCI's QRP quarterly at some point. Um, thank you all for listening to me. 73, and we'll talk later. Outstanding job, Dave. That uh, huh. was fascinating to watch. Thank you, thank you very much. We've got some time for some questions. Let's open it up. Certainly. Let's see, there should be a few in the uh, question and answer window. Can you see those? Oh, just have to press the magic button. Uh, let's see, Q and A. First few questions uh, pertain to the balloon presentation, which was excellent. Yeah, just scrolling okay. okay, here we go. Uh, for Brian Murray, uh, appreciate your comment about the Hilltopper. Uh, I'm not certain it will make a return. Uh, there may have been a, a small uh, recent batch going out. Uh, I think that's probably over and done with at this point. Uh, and this question from Doug Wilner, AC9RZ. Dave, what are your prototyping homebrewing methods? Uh, I do do some uh, classic breadboarding on copper clad board uh, if I'm uncertain what's going to happen. Uh, by and large, however, uh, I'm uh, doing uh, printed circuit board, uh, having, uh, having those made uh, at fairly reasonable prices. Uh, and of course, there's always a, a revision or two uh, involved. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, and a question from Dave. Uh, Dave New, N8SBE, uh, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I did get the full gallon. It's uh, five watts uh, or a little bit more. 
the uh, the uh, three parallel BS 170s do a pretty good consistent job with that. And thanks for asking. Oh, and a comment from Ron. Thank you. Uh, the Hilltopper will return. Uh, appreciate that. That's from Ron, AG1P of uh, Four State uh, QRP Group. Uh, I have tried another speaker. Uh, the jury is still out on this. Uh, this is uh, in answer to Jamie Anderson's question. Uh, it, it appears to uh, do much the same thing. It's at fairly low signal level uh, as far as an incoming CW signal. And it also appears to be uh, at or around the speaker's self resonance frequency. Uh, I have not tried the foam baffle. Uh, it does seem uh, like it would be worth giving it a shot. So, uh, and I'll point out that the uh, the earbuds uh, don't exhibit this behavior. Uh, I did an awful lot of troubleshooting with the electronics and uh, uh, that was the conclusion I'd come to. Oh, okay. Uh, and Paul, uh, WA9PWP, uh, thanks for chiming in. Dave, sounds like your speaker's internal your radio's internal speaker problem is a rubbing voice coil. Uh, good point. Uh, another speaker would be uh, readily available and uh, certainly worth a try at, uh, at a reasonable price. Uh, for Neil, uh, Neil Ormos and 9NL, how many board spins were required for each board? Uh, usually I got it right on the second try. Uh, uh, neglecting, of course, the uh, the uh, repeated lack of success on the uh, on the phasing design itself. Okay, I'm going to stop you here and let you answer further questions offline during the sure. next time. Sure. Uh, again, I want to thank you, Dave, and look forward to next year. We have door prizes which we will get out right now. Uh, I missed announcing the ones at 10 o'clock, uh, but uh, donated from Four States QRP, a group I know quite well. Uh, a Bayou Jumper goes to VE3THR, Tom Muzzin. Cricket 30 goes to KG7EMV, uh, Marino Duragon. Another Cricket 30, goes to ZL1LC, Jim Reed. A Freak Mint goes to N2VGU, uh, Donald Brandt. A Hyper Mite goes to Wayne Pesina, N1WP. Ozark Patrol goes to W0MNE, Mike Doty. A Morania Receiver goes to Charles Friley, Alpha Echo Zero ID. And a super simple CPO goes to Nick Tsakonis, uh, SV1DJG. Uh, we have um, also from the ARRL, an ARRL handbook from uh, uh, donated by the ARRL uh, goes to VA3. <laughs> RKM, Robert McKenzie, and an ARRL antenna book going to Charles Ott, K5HJ. Okay, uh, we are just about ready to bring up our next speaker, Jerry Wolkanski. How are you doing this afternoon, Jerry? Pretty good, sitting here waiting for the cicadas. <laughs> They're Ooh. on the way. I can give a little intro here at the beginning. Let's do that. Okay.
So are you ready? Does my screen pop up or do I have to do something here? Okay, let's, um, Bill is gonna start the video when that time comes. Okay. Yep. Well, I can, I can start chatting yep. here. So Go ahead. From, a, from a sheer, the, my, my topic is uh, building an antenna coupler and from a sheer parts count from Benson's uh, thing, uh, my, my presentation should only last two or three minutes, but I've managed to stretch it out to 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. <laughs> so the, the uh, presentation was ported over from my Linux machine to a, to a Mac lap, my wife's Macintosh laptop. And some of the slides didn't render quite as well, but I don't think anything is going to be missed. Also, the, in doing a little editing on the beginner, the, the, the title slide got, got snipped off. Uh, but that shouldn't that shouldn't present a problem. And there's one little verbal gaffe in there somewhere along the line where I describe my 55 dB feed line, 55 dB long feed line. Well, as it turns out, we all know that uh, dBs are not a unit of measure. Although I suppose if you have a, a strong signal and more dBs, it does go a little further. <laughs> so anyway, the coupler we're going to be talking about in here is up behind me to my, to my there. And this is a pre-recorded uh, Zoom session. So Bill, you can let her rip. Patient is going to be uh, about making an antenna coupler. The antenna coupler they're going to be talking about is the one just above my head with the funny little all the wires sticking out of, out of the front panel. Give you a quick tour of the station. On the bottom left is a homebrew 40 meter direct conversion transceiver. I talked about that a couple of years ago. To the right is a 30 meter uh, super hat transceiver. Above that is a 20 meter uh, transceiver. And then, then, then my, my K2. Two tuners piqued my interest uh, 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 at RC and fiddled with L and reflected power was prevented. The, the, the balance, the subject of balance has gotten to be so complicated anymore. There's a recent QRP ARCI uh, talk, somebody tossed out an innocent question about a Carolina Wyndham. And the, the post finally stopped at 74 posts. Most of it was arguing about balance, just amazing. In the 1950 antenna book, you can find like two paragraphs about balance. Now that's all we can talk about. Some technical terms, this is uh, the Dewey Decibel system, this uh, loose parts. Dave Blazek must be one of the funniest the cartoonists uh, going. This was uh, in the Washington Post. Here's Zach Lau's tuner. The schematic is a little convoluted because it, he was doing all kinds of things. He did two things here. He had a tapped inductor and, and he had a, his shunt element was a capacitor and he could move the capacitor to either the input or the output of the thing and that would make it either, either to work on either higher or, or low uh, impedances. And then his balance, as you can see here, was on the, on the transmitter side. And this one was the uh, uh, tuner from Zach Lau. I'm sorry, I misspoke, Dean Straw. And Dean Straw is retired from the AWRL. And this, this tuner was a beast. It was a uh, one kilowatt uh, high pass T network with a, with a choke balance on the antenna, on the rather than the transmitter side. And his, this was also floating from ground, but put in a shielded in a shielded box. To uh, talk a little bit about uh, my, uh, my antenna, my antenna is a 65 foot flat top fed with homemade open wire line. Um, the spacers are just plastic scrap and the wire is number 14 insulated wire from the hardware store. And uh, I think this is just a wonderful, wonderful feed lines. Before I go any further, I got to tell you that Dean Straw's article, Don't Blow Up Your Bell, and maybe the best seven pages ever written on the subject of antenna tuners and whatnot. It's in the June 2015 QST, pages 30 through 36. And if you're an AWRL member, you can go back in the digital archives and pull this thing up. I actually cut it out of mine with a razor blade and scanned it into my computer so I could uh, refer to it on occasion. What a beautifully written article, which uh, uh, talks about balance and transmission lines and, and, and more appropriately loss in antenna tuners and, and matching systems. So there's a big argument about whether balance should be on the transmitter side or the, the antenna side. And I've never seen such fervor among the uh, 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 
the proponents of the transmit uh, antenna side rather they get into big arguments when you tell people you're going to make a couple with a bell on the transmitter side uh it's like uh, uh calling them names tuners like this must be isolated from ground and so so a wonderful talk i think it was uh, uh Joel Hollis from the AWRO, the doctor is in, talked about a huge toroid that can be slid over the antenna coupler. It should make no difference whether the toroid is on the antenna side or the ATU side. Here's a little sketch that I made to try to, uh, to, to show that. The rationale for a uh, balance on the uh, 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 heating, the antenna side, the, an argument is made that the balance will be subject to heating. And for sure, that's true. I mean, when you have open wire antenna systems, you can get some pretty high SWRs. I mean, it would not be uh, uncommon to have SWRs of 20 to one or, or maybe even higher on an open wire system. It's also claimed that a balance on the transmitter side will then be operating at its design impedance. In other words, at that point, you've, you've transformed the impedance down to 50 ohms. So, but, the, but let the fight go on, go, go off, go out on the internet and pose this one and see what people say. Speaking of balance, I had mentioned this earlier, the uh, fear over balance, there's, there's a QRZ.com, there's an antenna thing in there. And I think most of the uh, people weighing in and asking questions and being yelled at and scolded and, and whatnot, uh, it's mostly all about balance. W7EL wrote a beautiful paper on balance, what they do and how they do it. I stole his drawing. If you're if you're out there, uh, 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 Roy, uh, thank you. <laughs> I owe you a beer. But this is basically what what the balance, what the issue is. We have a balanced transmission line. And we have an unbalanced uh, rig, and this is sort of what the balance the balance does. It takes you from that balanced uh, feed to an to an unbalanced uh, uh, in this case source. And here's here's what I love about the balance the balance fight. So years ago, Halley's comet was was what coming visiting Earth, I think it was 1976. And you're probably wondering what Halley's Comet has to do with antenna couplers. Well, there was a big bruja uh, in, the, in the astrophysics community. It's tumbling about the long axis. No, it's tumbling about the short axis. Well, as it turns out, as it turns out, both sides were right. And that's the way it is with some of these arguments. Here's the deal. You're wrong, I'm right. I'm right, you're wrong. We're both wrong, we're both right. And so it is with balance. There's a, a, more than a few ways to skin a cat with balance. And I think you just have to keep that in mind when, when you begin winding these things. I've made several varieties and I'm not seeing a lot of difference, at least in the bands that I've been operating on. So, so it is with balance. Remember, the, the, you can both be, both be right. I built Dean Strauss coupler. I didn't exactly replicate his design. And then I began to make some measurements. So his was built on what he called a common substrate. And the common substrate I used was a metal plate. The front panel of this thing was a piece of, it looked like Bakelite, but I've bought some Bakelite since then and it didn't look like that, but it was a very hard, hard material like, like Bakelite. And I began to make measurements. The measurement that I began really thinking about was the, the balance measurement. In other words, in other words, your coupler, if you're going to be feeding a balanced antenna system, you need to be shoving energy out into that that two wire line uh, in equal equal uh, and opposite in, in phase. The imbalance can be compensated. I hooked this test up to Dean Straw's coupler, and the balance was awful. I could not ever figure out exactly why. I thought I thought the balance could be compensated for. I couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, uh, so. So the, the issue of, of a balance in the feed line is pretty important. Um, an unbalanced feed line, as we know, radiates energy and distorts the pattern of your flat top antenna. An unbalanced antenna also becomes a vertical receive antenna. It picks up a local noise, which we, we say is vertically polarized. So coupler imbalance, at least in my traditional installation, I have down here causes noise. It doesn't cause noise, it picks up noise. That's probably the better way to say this. So you have to be careful. Feed lines, antennas that have feed line as part of the antenna, maybe the Carolina Wyndham and some of these others, I'd be real cautious about using antennas like this as a noise pickup. Lloyd Butler, here's, here's the guy who came up with a way of measuring the antenna balance, that schematic that I had earlier. So, so 
apart from distorting the radiation pattern, it encourages induction into equipment uh, of, the, of, the, of the vertically polarized noise near the field source. This is actually true, and I actually was able to prove this. This is how I measured it. Put a couple of resistors in there and use a high Z probe uh, to, to measure the output. Now, he, he went through a rather extensive uh, 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 a measurement uh, uh, procedure where he used a, a bunch of very different uh, different resistors. I think I pretty much stuck with 620 ohm. Just wanted to get a relative uh, uh, understanding of the of the antenna balance. How good should a tuner balance be? Well, it's interesting. He he thought that above 80 percent is being tolerable and above 90 percent is being quite good. I found those numbers to be uh, 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 not good enough. I found you really needed to be in the in the mid nineties to be to be uh, to be not have, not having noise pickup, which was objectionable. So eighty percent. Where did that come from? So I used my Johnson matchbox, by the way, which kind of comes in at a hundred percent. Yeah, what a beautiful coupler. And I purposely unbalanced the antenna with a variable capacitor on one leg until the noise came up. About, about 3 dB, and then I measured the balance, it was about 85%. Now, now the, this is not the most scientific uh, test because the, the, uh, my estimator on my K2 that I was using is a little bar graph, so was it 3 dB or 4 dB or 2 dB, I'm not sure. But at any rate, it was in the neighborhood of 3 dB noise, and it was very, very, 3 dB is quite a bit of noise. I measured the balance, it was 85%. You really want to have a copper, which is much better than 85% in terms of, in terms of balance. So while well, that uh, Dean Straw coupler didn't work, uh, so I decided to go to an L network, which was uh, basically what Zach Loud did on his. And the, uh, the, Zach, the, the L network coupler, if you're gonna use a reversible one, you can make it with just two components. And you can make it either high pass or low pass. So Richard measures, uh, if you go Google AG6K and, and look at this, has a wonderful little paper on uh, these, and these balanced antenna couplers. By the way, he terminates his coupler in a, in a, in a, in a, fifth, in a one to one balance on the transmitter side of the thing. And you can see that he has got two, four variations of the L, L networks. The L network that I uh, selected was a high pass configuration. And here's why I have a 22 kilowatt daytime flamethrower broadcast station, which is uh, th exactly three kilometers from my house. And uh, it, uh, it has caused problems. I've had problems when they, they've had their transmitters go amok. These places are all remotely operated now. And uh, here recently it, it was putting out all kinds of garbage into the 40 meter ham band. And I spent a lot of time yelling at the FCC to have somebody go over there and, and eventually it got fixed. But so I picked the high pass configuration uh, for this only reason, you don't have to do that. I picked the reversible L network and I picked to, to have the inductor as the shunt element. If the, if the inductor is in position A, that's for a high impedance load. And if the inductor is switched over to B is a, is a uh, for, for a low impedance loads and quite low impedance too, I must say. Now here's the deal. I I, I show a switch here, and and I did build one of the couplers, one of my prototypes, with a huge ceramic switch out of one of these World War II antenna couplers, and uh, something was I mean I said just did not seem to work very well, and I finally figured out there was just enough straight capacitance in there to bugger things up. On one of the couplers I built, I put a, a couple of banana jack. Um, sockets back there where I could just jumper from the top of the inductor to either position A or B with a, a banana jack short. And finally, in the version of the coupler that I have on, on my operating station right now, I just have a small uh, piece of wire with a big alligator clip on the end of it. And I just reach back there and move it from one part of the capacitor to the other. But the simpler you make this, uh, the better things go. And some precautions. Some some years ago, this making antenna couplers is a lot of fun. But I burned up a couple finals in my K2 while tinkering, and so I ended up making one of these resistive bridge uh, 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 SWR bridges, so that when you're in the tune position, the SWR bridge is providing a pretty decent load to the K2 or whatever your transmitter is while you're tuning. 
And I tell you, if you're going to play with antenna couplers, uh, really, this is this is a, a I think it's a necessity. I think I just saw a big dummy load too on the latest QRST, which uses a bunch of these resistors. But anyway, this is what the guts of the uh, of the of the resistor bridge look like. So just to be safe, I put my shack bridge in line as well. And I have to do that the way my rig is, my, the way my station is currently configured. I have another bridge here, and this is also a homemade bridge. And this is uh, uh, by G3YNH. It's a beautifully, beautifully written uh, uh, design bridge, rather. It, it has very low insertion loss, less than 0.1 dB. They had the K2, by the way, another argument for buying a K2. The finals were 18 bucks. I don't know, try that with your, with your new Kenwood or something like that. So in the process of arguing about uh, where the balance should be, one of the guys from the old QRP tech forum, David Ryburn, uh, who was uh, vehemently against me putting a, a ballon on the transmitter side, uh, I gave him the, what I thought were the dimensions of my um, feed line and antenna system. And he sort of came up with what he thought the impedances might be in a, in a model. I later on measured uh, these things. And th while this is, not, this is not exactly what my antenna turned out to be, it's, it shows a, its representation. It's, it's good enough. And it really tells you a nice story here about open wire line. If you take a look, uh, using a 40 meter antenna, on 80 meters uh, with uh, 55 dB uh, uh, open of open wire feed, the loss was 2 dB. And now as you get up to where the antenna is a large, larger in terms of wavelength, 40, 30, 20, and onwards, the losses become uh, basically not measurable. The impedances get to be a little awkward, but the losses, the antenna losses become, become um, uh, very, very low. This is really the lesson for open wire line. And one of the reasons that I think people really need to reconsider uh, open wire feed, you know, most of a lot of the modern antenna designs we have have a lot of uh, really, really unusual designs to present a less than three to one load to a modern transmitter, which has, which has a built in ATU. Uh, this is sort of an old school way of doing it. You're guaranteed it's going to work pretty well. Go back and talk about the Johnson matchbox. This is the gold standard. No matter how many times I measured this, it always come out to be exactly 100%. This picture's from the internet. It's basically the covers are off. Those of you who've owned a Johnson matchbox, you know, to take one of these apart, I think it's 40 screws and it's, a, it's an afternoon's work and you've got to get everything all set up before you put the cover back on. I got mine for 25 bucks at a ham fest and uh, it didn't work. I don't know what the heck was going on with it. So I went through the laborious process of taking it apart. And when I did, I found out that one of the big heavily soldered wires had, had come adrift over the years. So I re-soldered it, put it back together and bingo, I got a great one. I wanna give you a tour of some of the other couplers I've made over the years. You know, Farhan, if you're out there, what a great tuner this is. If you go on Farhan's site and Google balance tuner, this is, this is my version of, of, of his antenna coupler. This is for balance feed only. I think you can unbalance one leg and it'll work that way. This is the front panel, all these switches, which short out inductors on the, on the rear panel. There's the tuning capacitor. What a neat, what a neat coupler. I have since uh, something happened to one of these switches. And so I've, I'm going to have to, I'm going to rebuild this thing and use, use some different switches. Those switches were really hokey. And, and then there's VK5BR, Lloyd Butler, his, his uh, if you go to Lloyd Butler's website, VK5BR, he's sort of the, uh, the modern daddy of the, of the, of the Z-Match uh, transmitter. And it, when you go back and look at that little drawing I had earlier that he had a correction capacitor in there, that if he, he thought that if you got a, a load on the Z-Match that was not balanced, that you could put a capacitor to ground in one of the legs and fix this. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. This is a nice little uh, 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 coupler. There's my version. It's not the prettiest uh, uh, coil that I want there, but it works pretty good. But you can see that uh, you really pro probably want to be above 90%. And I have that on 40. It works pretty good on 82, as I recall. I don't know why I didn't take a measurement of that. So, and Lloyd Butler also designed a T200, uh, uh, a big fat toroid version of this thing too. And uh, he uh, suggested that the open frame coil would work better. 
here's my version of a plug-in coil matchbox. I did not measure the balance of this thing uh, because I think it could be, no matter, you could probably arrange the taps to make the, make the balance perfect regardless of, uh, of uh, the output. So here's, this is interesting. I had a hand buddy over to my house, uh, um, George Lee Master, if you're out there, how you doing? And we hooked up my my uh, my Johnson Matchbox to my balanced antenna, and there was some line imbalance, and and I th I thought, well, isn't that odd? You know, the coupler is perfect, but we have some imbalance here. Well, I went out and looked off the deck, and sure enough, one of my legs in my dipole was touching a tree branch. Well, there's various ways to to incur imbalance in an antenna system. One of them is to use a poorly designed a couple or the other one was to have a tree branch. <laughs> so I found a trimmer for that. There you go. <laughs> so so if you're if you're of a mind and can get a, somebody up high enough in the tree to do that. So but but Lloyd did suggest you could put a balancing capacitor. You would have to sort of experiment which leg you wanted to put that on. And I fiddled with this actually, and it works pretty nice. You can actually see the two. Uh, waveforms uh, sliding back and forth across each other. It's going to be a crapshoot as to which uh, link, uh, which uh, leg you want to put this on. And you cannot use this uh, uh, little little balancing gymnastic thing on a coupler like my L network because I, I think it only works on couplers with link windings. I tried this on my L network and it just plain didn't work. That capacitor was just in, in parallel with the uh, with the. Uh, uh, either the inductor or the inductor and the capacitor, and that just wasn't ever gonna play. But a balanced capacitor probably would work if you had a, a couple with a link winding. This was pretty neat to do. It was pretty, it was fun to do. So after I built Dean Strauss coupler and it didn't work, I thought, okay, plan B, I'm gonna make a coupler just for four days in May that did not use an expensive roller inductor. And the problem there is, and I have an article uh, in, in QRP Quarterly about the how to mimic the fidelity of a, of a roller inductor. You know, a roller inductor is, is infinitely variable. I mean, you have, a, because, it, because it's a roller inductor. But they're very expensive and they, and they can be dirty. I have a, a couple of roller inductors and one of them just, just sort of bounces around. I'm forever cleaning the, the coil and, and uh, I, I, you, can, you can buy new, new ones of these things for, they're pretty pricey at some of the ham fests. Occasionally you'll find one for 10 or 15 bucks, and if you do, go ahead and buy one. So I, I wanted to make an inductor with both coarse and fine tuning to try to, to mimic the fidelity of the coupler. First, I made the coarse tuning uh, uh, inductor. I, I did a QRP, a QRP quarterly article about making a tapped uh, inductor. Um, and so I made a faux roller inductor, and there the article talked about that. This was number 14 solid wire, uh, I think there was like 22, 25 turns around a, a T200 yellow um, amidon core. And then you have to make a template. Those of you who uh, uh, remember your old high school, maybe you still have your protractor. You remember your protractor? I guess you can still buy one. But So you have to make a drawing of this thing and then drill, drill the board in where it goes in and then fit these wires into the thing. It takes a little doing. Uh, but it but it can be done, and th this was a prototype coupler that I was using, and you can see the front panel is uh, not made for prime time. It was some kind of a, uh, a cardboard on steroids. It was like a pressed cardboard or something. I don't know what this material was. I have a few more pieces of it around the house, and it's pretty nice to use actually. Fitting the coil in there is fine tuning necessary, and the answer is probably yes. I, any of these antenna couplers that I built above 20 meters, I really couldn't get a good match. Uh, 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 by that, I mean really close to one to one. Your mileage may vary. You might get lucky and find out that your coil taps on the gross coil uh, uh, are, are sufficient. So I tried, <laughs> don't give up your day job, Jerry. Actually, I'm retired. I did give up my day job. I tried making a variometer and uh, this was kind of fun. This was one of the versions and this is when I decided Man, I need I need a, a, a different plan. I this kind of worked. And by the way, out on the internet, the the internet wog suggested the variometer is a very bad idea for an antenna coupler. I'm not so sure I agreed with that uh, uh, conclusion. 
I made tap coils. I tried uh, brass bolts, steel bolts, switches, many turns, few turns. And uh, this really didn't seem to be uh, giving me the variation and in inductance that I wanted. And finally, I ended up just making a, the, the baby brother of my big coil. I just used a, a T80 coil. I think it was a 10 position switch or 10 or 11 position switch. And I made that there. And, uh, you know, you, these switches are probably available out on the eBay and stuff like that. I had a couple in my junk box. And now, as it turns out, the fine tuned coil in conjunction with the, the coarse tune coil is absolutely perfect. I can get a match on all bands. But before I did the fine tune coil, I tried some other stuff. Here's my prototype. And uh, that I call this, it's in a file in my computer called the, the ugly coupler. And you can see why. The ballot over there that I used uh, was a, one of those ones with a pair of windings, a transmission line winding. I later uh, replaced that with a coax, a coax down. And here's the prototype, the prototype. And you can see the big clip lead where I can clip onto the antenna side or the rig side of the variable capacitor to change the loads for either high impedance or low impedance. This is it. This is a, you pretty can't, I can't make the antenna couple more complicated than this. This is a very, very nice coupler. So I made a nicer version of this coupler using a roller inductor. I have a trick quiz. You know, you know what the answer to this is. <laughs> so, but here's the here's the quiz question: Which coupler had the better uh, uh, um, balance? Well, the answer was the ugly one by by a large margin. And uh, I'm not sure I ever understood the two of them uh, on, on connected to the same antenna and same frequency. The ugly coupler was vastly superior. There was no noise. The handsome coupler built on 30 meters had at least one s unit of noise. I'm not so sure I measured the balance, but it must have been in the low 80s. And uh, I'm not sure I quite understood the reason. Of, it may very well be that the big roller inductor, you know, has a large electromagnetic field and, and sort of maybe that was in, uh, a part of the reason why the, the balance was, was, uh, was uh, not so good. I don't, I don't know. All I know is that the ugly coupler uh, won. Both had the same... To, to the shielded coupler versus the open. The other coupler was just a very simple layout. So I built an improved version of the ugly coupler and it wasn't as good. The other coupler is too ugly, so I made the nice version that used a tap that used tap toroids, but I used slide switches for the tap toroids. Okay, this is pretty, isn't it? Well, guess what? <laughs> If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, what did the guy say? Make an ugly woman in your life. This was a little bit too pretty. The slide switches uh, just didn't work. The balance of this coupler uh, was uh, not so good. I, I can't remember what it was. I have it written down in a notebook somewhere. But the ugly coupler was still the uh, was still winning the day. The balance improved dramatically when the slide switches suddenly were removed from the circuit. But I did lose the fine tuning. So the final version, here it is right here. This is in, in use right now. You can actually see that maybe over my shoulder up there uh, on my uh, stack of ham gear. Up there, like that. there it is. And so to change bands on this thing is you just, I have a little lookup table, a piece of paper, uh, you know, for 30 meters, I put, I put this clip lead on number 10. I set the uh, capacitor to number 13 and switch on number seven. And I'm pretty much, um, ready to go. So QS1 with these things is just a matter of a few seconds. Pretty nice. There's the top view. There's the, uh, the little alligator clip lead to uh, change, the, change the low impedance from the high to high impedance input to low impedance antenna input right there. And that's it. I use this on, on, my, on 80 meters and it works just very, very nice. 80, I, all the way through 10 meters. I have it all with all the bands. The final balance, uh, this is when I started playing with Ballons uh, with a 20 turn bifolar Ballon. This was a Ballon uh, with bifolar wound coil, 97, 95, 90. These are pretty good numbers. Uh, not as good as a Johnson Matchbox. And, and why that went on 15 meters was that way, I have, I have no idea. I started playing around with uh, coax and uh, clearly I was either using this wrong core or not enough turns or something but I ran very good balance numbers on the lower bands. And on 20 turns of coax, uh, uh, I ended up uh, with the perfect balance on 30 meters and good balance on some of the other bands. Maybe somebody who, who uh, 
understand his balance can explain these numbers. One of my conclusion was, I don't know that much about balance. <laughs> the one-to-one -one current balance is suggested by W70L seemed to provide the most consistent results. So when I thought, well, you know, I've been uh, uh, arguing with people about putting a balance on the antenna side of the coupler for this uh, entire time. But what about, I, I said, I'm sorry, if I'm, I've been arguing about my case about putting a balance on the transmitter side of the antenna coupler, let's put it on the antenna side of the coupler and see how it goes. So I put a, my one-to-one -one, uh, balance on the antenna side of the coupler and, and I got slightly better results, but the tuning, I, I'm not sure I understand why this was the case. The tuning was very awkward and very critical. Uh, um, I found the, uh, my, my, my tuning numbers, my presets were very, very different and uh, uh, something was going on. So, but these are very, very good numbers. If you're gonna, if you're gonna build this thing, try it both ways. Uh, if you're happy with the way the tuning is, I would build it uh, with the balance on the antenna side. It, 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 so. so the balance measurements that I did basically confirm I mean, the difference between maybe 96%, 99% was not a whole lot of difference in, in balance. What about a coil balance? I just finished reading on one of the antenna forums, uh, Zach Lau talking about this uh, coil balance, which I made. Uh, it made pretty good balance, but it was very noisy. And so my guess is that uh, you probably ought to avoid this. I think a coil, a coil bound at the antenna feed point, I think is a perfectly acceptable way of, of, of doing a, a, a choke thing to keep, uh, keep uh, RF off the outside of the transmission line. But I think for the purposes of making an antenna coupler and, and going, the, going for the, uh, balanced to an unbalanced thing, I think you probably ought to avoid this. Now the four to one balance is interesting. Well, I tried a couple of different four to one balance. And, and I can tell you right now, I think a four to one balance on the antenna side of an antenna coupler is, is, not, is a bad idea. In fact, I would say on the lower bands, it's not just a bad idea, it's a supremely bad idea. So you can see that the, the impedances of, of an antenna, of my antenna, with my with my with my bound are are pretty good, but when you get down to 80 meters, where the resistive component of the feed line impedance is 11 ohms, and when you use a four to one balance, you're now transforming that 80 meter impedance to 1.9 ohms with a reactance of 157 microns. And my apologies for not changing this to R plus or minus JX. I was just too lazy to do that. 1.9 ohms is a big ask for an antenna coupler and I think really puts a little strain on the inductor. I would just not do this. You can see the four to one balance probably works okay on the higher bands, but I quite frankly, uh, if I had a trim, an antenna coupler that had a four to one balance on the front end of this thing, the antenna side, I think I'd go in and try sticking in a replacement. The coupler with a balance on the transmitter side is now in daily use and works perfectly on all bands 80 to 10 meters. And that was sort of, that's sort of the takeaway, but I'm not done yet. <laughs> so, so the, the, uh, the, I'm just realizing these slides aren't, uh, on. so, so one of the wogs on the internet, you, don't you just love all the experts out there, don't use an SWR meter and steal more than half your power. And I thought to myself, really? I don't think so. So the, this person who said this must have been thinking about a resistive bridge. Okay, well, that's possible. So I built uh, a fleet of SWR measuring devices. This was rather fun. Uh, and you know, you can build one of some of these things in like a couple of hours. So I wanted to measure the, the loss of SWR bridges, just how bad, how bad is it? Uh, so I built a whole bunch of these things. And this was really a lot of fun. First thing you gotta do is build a good, uh, make sure you got a good dummy load and that's off on the left-hand side there. I've got, a, I think a bunch of uh, uh, 150 ohm resistors in parallel. I think, I think the, the, the one I liked the best was the Stockton Bridge. For those of you who buy stuff from WABIZ, I would run that walk to the computer and put down an order for his Stockton Bridge. I don't know how he makes any money selling these things. You're gonna need meters, but these things are just remarkably sensitive. Two watts on 30 meters pins a one milliamp meter. The insertion loss was 0.33 dB, 
perfect null uh, when connected to a 50 ohm low line. The meter was just laying on the peg. And the kit, I think, is, I don't know, 12 bucks, 20 bucks from WABIZ. So I would go right now. Well, as soon as this is done, go buy one. <laughs> if you're out there, WABIZ, you can give me a commission. These are wonderful bridges. There it is. It works so much better with the 1 in 34 diodes than the, than the recommended diodes. So, and you might be able to, or could vary the, the, the windings to lower the insertion loss. I surely wouldn't, 0.33 dB insertion loss, I wouldn't worry about it. The, the other thing is uh, that his bridge does not come with meters, but I would uh, uh, go on the eBay. There's a lot of people bad mouth the meters from Chinese uh, uh, vendors, but I've gotten some really nice 50 microamp meters from Chinese vendors and uh, uh, they work just fine. The W7 QRP watt meter is exquisitely sensitive and maybe really not designed for total inline operation. And uh, it's, it has a perfect null. The insertion loss was 0.6 dB. I remind people what, uh, what uh, Mr. Bell said about uh, what dBs, that one dB was the least detectable amount that the human ear could detect. So there you go. His, the cores that he built uh, his with the, F, the type 72 cores are no longer available. I use type 77 cores. That watt meter is exquisitely sensitive. I didn't, I had no way of cranking the power down in that thing, but it probably works well down to the milliwatt range. And there's my version of it. The top one is the micro strip line, and then the bottom are the co components of that. The bridge that I have in my shack that I use right now is, is uh, pretty, pretty slick. It's a, if you Google G3 Y and H, you'll get this bridge. It, it requires some uh, rather tricky components. There's some 3.3 puff capacitors and 70 puff capacitors. I happen to have a ton of uh, uh, NP0 capacitors uh, and I was able to find those values in there. And it is a dual sampling network. I built three versions of it. One has an insertion loss so low that it's considered basically not measurable. It's perfect law. They're not very sensitive. If you're going to build one of these, you really need a micro ammeter. The one I'm using in my shack here is a 100 microamp meter. Uh, I could probably use a 50 microamp meter. And I found that the 1N34 diodes, it worked, it worked really well with, uh, with the electrostatic shield version. And there's what it looked like. So I basically put it in a, in a little box uh, like this. You know, when you got tons of printed circuit board, uh, you can just make these little things. And I use a, a heavy duty paper cutter to trim, to trim my circuit board. Here's another version of, of one of these things, one of the test versions. These are really fun to build. And, I, and you know, uh, one of the nice parts about playing with antenna couplers is it's not just antenna couplers you get to tinker with, it's all the ancillary devices, these bridges and all these other things. Those of you of us who go back far enough to remember when the micromatch and some of these early bridges came out, they were easy to build. You could build one in an afternoon. Now I'm, I'm compelled to talk about the vector network analyzer. I built a uh, antenna for 160 meters in, in my backyard. I talk about it a little bit in, in my, in a recent QRP quarterly article where I talk about my remotely switched antenna. 165 feet is a, is a length that will give you 50 ohms uh, resistive impedance on, on 160 meters, but with a considerable amount of inductive reactance. So you have to put a series uh, capacitor in, in the line to tune, it, to tune out the reactants. My inverted L, by the way, goes up 75 feet, now 90 feet, it's pretty nice. Right now I got 47 radials in the ground under it. So, so the question I had was, could I use the nano vector network analyzer to measure the antenna impedance, and then just use an online calculator to come up with the appropriate L and C matching components? And I thought, because the online calculators are just wonderful. I mean, I, I can't even imagine going with a calculator and, and hacking my way through some of the old calculations. So, so let's go back for a minute and re revisit my 22 kilowatt AM broadcast station. The daytime measurements of the inverted L antenna fluctuated severely. And it was my buddy VK6GX who suggested the problem was overload from the broadcast station. And sure enough, I think they go down their nighttime powers like 25 watts. So I went out there one night 
uh, fighting the mosquitoes at, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, nine o'clock at night and set up with the vector network analyzer and, and, and I got some pretty good readings or what I thought were pretty good readings from the vector network analyzer. The nighttime power was reduced. The, so I was able to measure the feed impedance uh, of the antenna. And I also was able to, to uh, measure the feed impedance of the antenna by hooking up an antenna coupler to it and measuring the inductance and capacitance of my two network antenna couplers. And I wanted to compare them to see how accurate the nano VNA was. And here's my little setup out in the yard. I got a car battery. I got my AADE uh, LNC measuring device. I got that other antenna coupler. I got my K2, there's a big car battery. And so I would just fire the rig up, tune this antenna for, uh, 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 and, and balance didn't matter here because this was an unbalanced antenna, tune the antenna for no reflected power and then measure the inductor value and the capacitor value. Well, if, if the nano VNA did its job, and the calculator did, uh, they, should, uh, they should pretty much be equal. Well, they weren't. And I thought, isn't that odd? So I, I decided I was going to build two little mini antenna couplers, one using the values from my L network coupler, uh, just mimic those values, and the other one using the online calculator to come up with the values for, for the impedance of the vector network analyzer. And it turns out the nano VNA measurements were close. But the LC component values taken from the coupler were spot on. So I think the nano VNA probably works a lot better uh, when you've got a, a, something that you're looking at with a piece of coax. I've fooled around with the nano VNA and the shack, and uh, I found that the, that the nano VNA, using it as an SWR bridge, hooking it ahead, basically looking up, looking at the, the output of the antenna coupler. It's more accurate than any of my bridges. So, so if you're going to go out and try to to replicate something like that, I don't think the I don't think the nano VNA is the way to go. You might get close. I don't know. And so this is the uh, antenna I was talking about wireless control. And when I first put this together, it didn't work. And then I realized that all those inductors were wired on the wrong side of the of the capacitors. <laughs> so. So this, this uh, uh, picture of the thing uh, shows the, the incorrect, uh, incorrect uh, thing. This is the article that showed up in QRP Quarterly. I got to pick up my little wireless device here. So I don't know what band my, my antenna coupler is set at right now, but, but one, of the, one of the things I can do to reset all these relays to zero I can just shut the power, shut the power to my bias T, and then I turn the power back on. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch this. Okay, my K2 is set for 30 meters. I'm going to push the 30 meter button. And the K2, I'm going to key it. zero reflected power. This is pretty neat. Um, so I have six relays here. One relay is straight through. I just take that wire and I send it down to my basement. I have a, a station down there that I listen to aircraft beacons. Position number two uh, is the 160 meter band. And what that does is, is, it, is it puts a, a series uh, capacitor in the line. And then the other circuits are, are, uh, are 80. 40, 30, and 20, and they all have little L network uh, components in there. What a nice thing to do. You know, this thing works. I was looking for remote uh, uh, control of, of, of an antenna coupler and the expense that you could, you could spend some real money uh, doing remote control of this thing. This thing was about 30 bucks for the combination. It gives me two transmitters. And it gave me six of these little receivers. The receivers are only single pull, single throw. So what the re what the receivers do is they end up providing energy to the little relays. You can see the little dark smudges that are mounted on the opposite side, on the underneath side of that plexiglass board. 
And so this is really cool. Now, for those of you who are looking for an antenna coupler that, that you know, you just push a button and it auto tunes your antenna. This is not that coupler. <laughs> now, this this does not work like that. This is a fixed device for us for a, for an antenna that's out in my yard. It's probably not going to until that tree falls down. This is probably going to stay the way it is. And lastly, uh, I think one of the better reasons to build an antenna coupler is to is to uh, build it in memory of Lou McCoy, who must have written got to be hundreds of articles about antenna couplers for the AWRL. What a great man, what great articles. And there's a great, I think, a book out there. It's still on eBay, and I'm going to see if I can't buy it one of these things. And lastly, the, the, the ultimate disclaimer, your mileage may vary. Imagine if, the, if when you were getting married, I now pronounce you man and wife, and he turns to your wife and says, your mileage may vary. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Jerry. Very interesting and informative article. Got uh, got a few questions. We'll right. let you handle those. Shoot. Okay. See the uh, questions and answers. Let me get the. Let me get this here. Sorry, I'm a little slow at the switch here. Let me go down here and. Uh... Yeah, somebody says that you, you're calling these couplers. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> there's, there was a great, uh, like two or 300 uh, message along thread as to, as to what people want to call these things. A uh, antenna matching units, antenna uh, transmit matching, you, you know, you can call them whatever you want. There are just impedance matching devices. <clears throat> and in the case of these couplers, it takes the impedance and also transforms it to, uh, I mean, how do you measure and calculate the balance? Basically, you just take a look at the two voltages. If the two voltages across the, the resistor that I use was 620 ohms, uh, and if they're the same, then the balance is 100%. If they're different, then you just do a little bit of a division in there and you can find out the, the actual uh, balance of the, of the cup. Any other questions out there? And for all you people out there who, who may or may not find a uh, <clears throat> Johnson matchbox out in the out on the internet, boy, if you find one, buy it. <laughs> and because you know the book on the, the Johnson matchbox, it uses instead of taps, it uses a capacitive divider a, across the main coil, so it doesn't have any physical taps like my home blue coupler. And the the it's allegedly that the uh, they don't ma match the range of impedances, particularly of the work bands. The the new bands, but but I've had mine in the shack, and quite frankly, you can get a pretty good match on, on all the bands. And again, your mileage may vary. You know, it depends on your feed line length. It, it may very well be that I'm just a lucky guy in my feed line in combination with my antenna leg length, because that, that's the real key, isn't it? One leg of the antenna plus your feed line length really determines the, the feed line impedance at your at your coupler or whatever you want to call it. Very good. Any other questions out there? How did I measure coupling down? Okay, I think, is there any more? Yeah. I can't see any more questions on here. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Jerry. Um, hope you'll be around later. I'm sure there'll be plenty more people to talk to. I will be. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everybody for sticking with us so far. Uh, we still have 337 attendees, so our attendance has held up really strong since early this morning. Uh, Jim W4QO wants me to mention that the uh, Hoot Owl Sprint will be this Sunday at 000 hours UTC, which I guess is technically Monday but uh, we don't want to miss that operating event. And I'm, I'm particularly honored to sit here today at this year, 2021, which we mark as the 60th anniversary of the QRP ARCI. Uh, it's been a long history. There have been a lot of tremendous articles published in QRP quarterly, a lot of really good FDIM events, and I, I'm glad to have attended the ones that I have. 
the next issue of QRP Quarterly, which will be coming out uh, for the July issue, it's going to be a special one. We're looking to have uh, uh, up to 60 pages of content and uh, a lot of really good contributors. So let's take a few more door prizes. Our friends at ICOM really outdid themselves. Not only did they donate the main door prize, which we will uh, send out after the end of the next presentation, but they sent us 30 t-shirts. And I will read off the names of those winners. Uh, winning an ICOM t-shirt is Bob Good, KF5VLJ, Anthony Zishka, AC9VM, Ron Doyle, N8VAR, Harold Whirling, N1FTP, Jawar Bami, K1JBD, Gary Perkins, K2OU, Ed Oxner, W8EO, Chauncey Chu, K1OPE, Jason Mildrum, NT7S, Dave Benson, K1SWL, Bob French, W9YA, Dennis Rayfield, K13F or KI3F, Brian Nail, uh, K0EMT, Jack uh, Kuntz, N8MCA, Ray Culbertson, W5EEG, Glenn Peterson, WB9QIQ, Ken DeLapp, uh, KX9U, Joe uh, Favre, Favre uh, WA9SGD, Mike Morgan, N0MPM, Ruben Birch, WA4ZEN, Stanley LaPointe, K7NUU, Kevin Welna, W5LNA, Larry Mikowski, W2LJ, Mike Lichtman, KF6KXG, Jeff Peters, K9JP, Randy Lemmel, WV9N, Malcolm Parsons, KI4KI, Ron Mosher, K0PGE, uh, Phil Erickson, W1PJE, and Martha Auchard, W0ERI. If you have a preference to size, please let me know. Uh, email me at nm0s at nm0s.com. Uh, it will take me a couple days to get all of these mailed out. So I'll hold off on these until I hear from as many of you as possible. Um, uh, additionally, I will compile a list of all the door prize winners and send that out in email here uh, in the aftermath of uh, our event. Take a little break, stand up, walk around. It's been an intense day, a lot of good information and all very enjoyable. And we will bring in our next speaker at the top of the hour.
Hi guys. Am I audible? The audio is a little bit low, uh, Farhan. Okay, I'll just push it up. Hello. There you go. Now Much good. better now? Yeah. I just <laughs> brush myself up a little. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everybody. It's about 2.30 a.m. here in Hyderabad. So, um, nevertheless, uh, great to see all familiar faces here. And I have actually recorded a, uh, a video, but you know, on second thoughts, what I thought is that I'd just run through this uh, presentation and make it a little more compact because the, the video is actually a little over an hour. So I thought it might be actually easier for me to sort of, you know, snip through it and just get to the meat and potatoes here. I will let you go ahead and do so. Uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Thanks very much. OK. So let me first start the presentation and see if, because I'm also having a dual monitor system here. So let me just see if I can. OK. All right. OK. You guys can see the slide, the first slide of mine? Yep. Okay. All right. All yes, right. looks good. All right. So um, now this uh, is a pre presentation which is about probably three years in making. And accordingly, you will see that it's a little, it keeps dive, you know, digressing into various blind alleys, but nevertheless, we will you know, stick to this. So uh, SBTX is essentially um, a bidirectional transceiver, but more importantly, it's an open source SDR, which is meant for the QRP people, which you can hack into, which you can sort of understand and which you can play with and adopt to the way we make QRP radios right now. So if, I mean, you know, um, if you were seeing the sort of uh, stuff that we've been talking about today, and the sort of radios that we've been building. Now, those are the kind of radios which are, you know, which again resemble something like this. Uh, this is something that I made when I was quarantined for a week uh, on a suspected, uh, you know, COVID infection. Thankfully, I didn't have it, but nevertheless, I just grabbed whatever parts I could from my shack and got into my bedroom and I was logged in there for a week and I built this. This is. Uh, essentially a version of W7EL's optimized transceiver. It's got full break-in. It's uh, just seven megahertz. But the, the key thing is that it's a completely analog design, right? It's a direct conversion analog design and it is, uh, it's a very simple uh, radio and it gives a fair amount of satisfaction to build. But on the other hand, you know, there are times when you want to build something which is far more complicated, which is multi-band, which has got all your uh, different kinds of filters. It's got AGC in it. It's got you know, different modes. So this actually, if someone, uh, you know, some of you might remember is the HBR made by VE7CA, uh, Marcus Hans, uh, Hans Marcus. So this took him about five years to build. You know, it's got just about every feature that you can think of from full break-in to being multi-band, uh, as you can see that there are a lot of filters in the back end. You can see this here, uh, and this kind of radio is actually pretty difficult for an average ham to build. Uh, firstly, because we do not have the money to build this. Second thing is that we do not have the equipment to build it, and third is that we don't have the time to build this. But given this, and given the amount of difference now that you see between what we build ourselves and what the market offers, like the, one of the previous presentations that we saw was of IC705, uh, followed by a presentation, which is about a really fabulously minimalist transceiver, which probably had about one millionth the number of transistors that the IC705 had, but nevertheless, it just performed as well. So. Really the big thing is that what do you do to up your game 
to compete, at least technically speaking, with something like this. And the surprising thing here is this, that, you know, I just go back to what uh, Marcus uh, had made, which is this transceiver, and you see the complexity here. And on the other hand, if you match it up with the complexity of, let's say, the insides of an IC7300, you see that it's not very complicated at all. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is just the power amplifier and that's what's taking up more than 50% of the circuitry. And the actual circuit of the radio is on the left side, just you know, above the speaker. And you see that that's really small. That's really, really small. So um, the message is that the software defined radio te techniques when applied to our QRP way of building things can actually help us build simpler rigs, which will still have just about the same features that your commercial rigs will have. So uh, let me just start with a simple example of how to balance out the gain of a transmitter. I mean, for example, even, even if you build a two band trans transceiver, right? Uh, with switch band pass filters on as a superhead. And what's going to happen is that at 14 megahertz, the gain is going to be much lower than the gain is going to be on seven megahertz. And people spend a lot of time trying to figure this out. For example, Hans has made a QRP linear, which is about probably within a dB from 3.5 megahertz to 30 megahertz. And it's taken an immense amount of analog effort to get there. But there's a simpler way to do it digitally. So what you have to do is this, take your mic input, feed it to an Arduino and feed the Arduino to your radio. So here the Arduino basically keeps reading in the samples from the mic and it can either multiply it to by a factor to increase the gain or divide it by a factor to decrease the gain and feed it to the radio. So once you've built this in the Arduino, then you can use it everywhere else. Second, within the Arduino's capabilities is also the possibility of putting in a graphic equalizer. So you could actually put in a five band graphic equalizer for your microphone, all in software, which you just, you know, it's, it's like putting in a keyer into your QRP rig. So once you drop this in, you'll be able to get a speech compression, which will give you at least six to seven dB of additional gain, so to say. I mean, your, your signal will be so much stronger because you, you're compressing it or clipping it. You're, you have a graphics equalizer, which will make your $1 mic sound really good. And you will be able to equalize the gain all for you know, an expense of about $2 and an Arduino uh, without really bothering too much to resolder this each time for the, every new rig. But this is just a curtain raiser to what we can do. But we'll come to the actual capabilities of what's possible a little later. But I think at this point, let's also imagine of about what do you require from a software defined radio that you cannot get in an analog radio and what are the other stuff that we'd like to put into our radios, which will help us build simpler and easier radios. So the requirements are very briefly like this. That first is we require about 90 decibels of in-channel dynamic range. Uh, now, let me just explain what this means. Now, increasingly, the way we operate QRP on the bands is that we all cluster around certain frequencies, for example, 7075. Now, that's where all the FT8 operation happens within the, that three kilohertz. So at times you might have about 50 stations within that three kilohertz bandwidth. And, and it's, it's important that your radio be able to differentiate those stations and the more powerful stations do not overload and distort so much that the weaker stations are lost by the computer by the time the signal reaches the computer sound card. So which is why in channel, meaning that within the bandwidth that you tune to, the dynamic range has to be pretty high and probably about 90 decibels because 90 decibels is pretty easy to go between, you know, let's say an S5 and an S9 plus 30 or 40 dB signal. Second thing is it should be easy to use multiband operations or build multiband operations into it. 
Third is that it should be simple to operate. The, the rig itself should be simple to operate. And finally, it should be able to work natively with digital modes. And we will come to this particular point and I'll elaborate this a little more as we go along in my presentation. Okay, so this is our candidate that we will build a radio with these three parts being added to our regular QRP set. So first is uh, what you see here is the $4 that we spent on an audio codec. Now this particular codec here is a 24 bit codec, which means it can take two to the power of 24 different you know, voltage levels, but that's theory. Usually it's the, the practical number of bits that it can actually differentiate with uh, you know, amongst is much lesser. It's about two, two to the power of 16, which means you still have 65,000 different uh, levels that it can measure. I mean, you know, the steps of the audio, uh, which gives you about 100 dB of gain. Uh, uh, sorry, 100 dB of dynamic range. Then you have the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi costs about $40 and it gives you four core processing power uh, with immense amount of RAM, about four gigabytes of RAM. And it's got the complete operating system with the C compiler, the source debugger, everything, you know, all on board. And you see those pins which are sticking out at the back of it those are the general purpose IO pins, which you can use to control your radio, you know, plug in an SI5351 or, or whatever else. The third part is the display. And what often happens is that some really brilliant software written for radios or software defined radios get bogged down by the lack of a good display to be, which can, you know, put up the entire user interface in front of you. For instance, if you look at Frank's uh, TNC convolution is SDR. It has so many different filters which you can sw switch on. It's got so many different noise blankers and you know noise reduction systems that you can switch on and off. Um, but we are unable to access them because his uh, his screen is just 2.8 inch screen, and you have to keep scrolling through a lot of menus to get there. Which is why a big screen which has got touch on it is actually a far better idea because it can actually replace a lot of switches and knobs and we'll just come to how that's being done. So this is actually what the radio looks like. So now you see that you have got, of course, the obligatory tuning knob, but above that is another small knob and that knob controls the values that you are going to set in those buttons that you see on the screens. So for example, if you're going to say, uh, AGC, uh, you, you touch on the AGC button there and then you can turn the knob to change that setting. So essentially what I've done is that instead of having so many knobs and switches, we have used the capacitive touch display itself to paint the user interface and be able to change those things quickly. And there are actually multiple ways of doing this. One way is to actually also use a mouse with this because you have a Raspberry Pi with, with a complete operating system. So you can actually you know, click on any of these buttons and then change it to the mouse, or uh, you could change it with your fingers, or you could even do it through the keyboard. So, I mean, all those things are uh, you know, possible here. And you will see that it's got a waterfall with spectrum display, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a particular catch here, and we'll come to the catch later, but the most important win with such a system is this. Now here, you'll see that the radio itself is running your FT8 and you do not require to interface it with another computer because the Raspberry Pi is now built into the radio. All your digital modes, PSK31, right? Um, uh, HEL, SSTV, uh, CW, encoders, decoders, logging software, all that can be actually part of your radio and you do not have to actually interface it with either a laptop or to carry anything else with you. Your, your radio will be able to manage all these digital modes within its own box. And, it's, and it works seamlessly. There are no cables. There is absolutely no need for you to 
be messing about with a lot of other things you know in your shack so how do we get there how do we make our regular qrp radios look like this so first i will discuss how uh, a superhead like the microbit x which is a double conversion uh, superhead transceiver can be made to become a software defined radio and then second i will discuss a new radio that i am right now you know almost done with which is meant specifically to work with this particular software so here is the microbit x in a nutshell and this is the it's essentially a dual conversion transceiver as you can see here and the first if is at 45 megahertz so uh, on receive the the uh, you, you see the antenna on the top right um, it bypasses the power chain and through a low pass filter it comes to the first mixer and it and and the si5351 up converts the signals to 45 megahertz from 45 megahertz which is a ceramic filter it it's it's down converted to about 11 megahertz and at 11 megahertz if it's again demodulated back to audio and because it's a bidirectional transceiver the transmission you know process essentially works by traversing exactly the same signal path in the reverse direction this time switching in the power amplifier and the low pass filters so now given this what we will do now is that we are going to uh, first use the demodulator or the modulator mixer not to give out audio but to give out a lower if frequency of 15 kilohertz okay and your bandwidth here will be about 25 kilohertz instead of it being a 3 kilohertz ssb filter so we have to change the filter to a 27 megahertz filter so now you see here the change the big change in the original circuit is that from 11 megahertz ssb filter we have replaced this with a 27 megahertz filter um, which has a bandwidth actually of 30 kilohertz out of which we use only the middle 25 kilohertz and the bfo is offset slightly so that the output of the modulator is centered around 15 kilohertz and this is fed to your codec which is a 24 bit codec it's a wolfson um uh, wm8731 codec and that in turn is interface with the raspberry pi and the display so with this in place you are able to you know uh, make it look like this and this is the user interface of the microbit x and if you actually want to see what the microbit x itself looks like it's this so it's actually pretty simple you will see that those there are two coaxial wires which are going onto the microbit x which are soldered in there one is for the modulator the other is for the demodulator and the raspberry pi controls the frequency that the microbit x is tuned to through the usb which is you know following the standard cat protocol and it also you know handles the transmit receive change over when required and the raspberry pi in turn controls the entire radio so with this for an investment of about 100 dollars we are able to get an sdr going with a conventional superhead radio the big catch here of course there is a catch is that because of the limitation of using a crystal filter your um let me actually show you this back here the the bandwidth that you are able to digitize is about 25 kilohertz this is actually an early version so uh, let me actually show you a better picture of what the bandwidth looks like um uh, or probably we'll be able to see one a little later in the ahead so let me not disturb this yeah here it is okay yes this this is the one right so now you see that this uh, uh, is a span of 25 kilohertz here of the waterfall and the spectrum display so this is the major limitation that instead of being able to see let's say 500 kilohertz of the band you are able to see only 25 kilohertz of the band there is a, a hack to be able to see the full band but that involves plugging in an rtl sdr and tapping that onto the superhead's first 
mixer instead of tapping it off after the crystal filter, but we will not discuss that now because it's too confusing as it is. Okay, so uh, this is um, how we were doing the uh, porting micro, uh, 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 the micro bitex to work with the SBTEX software. But on the other hand, let's also see what we, we can do with this hardware with a, with a new radio, which is built to you know, work explicitly with the SBTEX software module. So what you see here is, the, uh, is a general purpose board, which is plugged onto the Raspberry Pi, which basically piggybacks onto the seven inch display. And there are a couple of, there are three circuit boards that you see here. On the left, of course, is the five uh, volt regulator. So it basically, it's a buck converter, which converts 12 volts, switching. Uh, it's, it, okay, all right, I have to mention this here. The big problem with this kind of an SDR is that it's a current hog. On an average, it's consuming about 600 to 700 milliampers. And if I had used a regular 7805 to convert 12 volts down to five volts, the current consumption would have gone to about 1.5 amperes. So in order to be more efficient, we have to use a switching regulator. And what you see on the left is a, is a standard $3 uh, buck five volt regulator. But the problem with this is that it generates noise, which is why I had to put two inductors before and after the actual module that I got to be able to filter out the noise. And I'll show you the circuit in a little while. The green PCB that you see here is the WM8731. And this time I have used a ready-made module, which is available from Microelectronica. Then on the right, then on the small PCB, which is, a, which is an SMD PCB, is the mic amplifier, which also connects to it. So what we have done is that we have used the WM8731, which has got two, that is left and right, uh, stereo input and a stereo output. And the left channel is dedicated to the receiver. So the output of the demodulator from the receiver comes into the left channel of the WM8731, and it goes out into the speaker. And the mic that you see here, the, the mic amplifier feeds to the right input channel. And you know you upconvert the baseband to 15 kilohertz and the 15 kilohertz SSB output, let's say, goes out to the modulator, which is now sort of upconverting it to 27 megahertz IF. Okay, so um, now apart from the microbitex itself, I have, I'm working on this new radio, which is actually already, except for the power amplifier, uh, which will have a dynamic range um, and uh, uh, limited to certain bands, but a much more simpler circuit diagram, uh, which also uses lower power and it's very simple to make. So how is this different from the micro bitex that we talked about? So let me actually you know, show you this circuit diagram or rather the block diagram. So you see here, what we have done is, this is a single conversion radio. And it's a single conversion radio with a 27 megahertz intermediate frequency. So at 27 megahertz intermediate frequency, we have the possibility of using just one low pass filter to be able to tune anywhere from zero to 21 megahertz. And it in effect becomes a, an up conversion radio. So it up converts the any signal between zero to 21 to 27 megahertz. And then the 27 megahertz is filtered through a 27 megahertz filter and it's brought down to 15 kilohertz in the, by the second oscillator, which usually is, a, is called a beat frequency oscillator in a regular superhead, but we'll call it a second oscillator because it's not beating it down to audio yet. It's beating it to an, a low intermediate frequency of about 15 to 20 kilohertz. So you see that this is the, broad architecture of what we are going to uh, build now or, or rather which I'm going to show you now. The key thing in this, as well as the micro bitex that I showed you earlier, is the ability to make a crystal filter, uh, which is about 30 kilohertz wide. 
And the point is that this was a big aha moment for me when I was able to actually build a QER SSB filter uh, with a bandwidth of about 30 kilohertz. And what happened was that these are the crystals. I mean, earlier, if you remember that the CB crystals were all, always the third overtone crystals, but now 27 megahertz fundamental crystals are easily available. And I bought a couple of them from the local market and I measured the emotional inductance, which came to about 0 0.004 Henry's. And then with that, after plugging it into the Dishal software, this is what I came up as a design. The inductors on the sides with the 27 PF capacitors are basically L matching network, which, which convert the 50 uh, ohms termination on either side to 2K impedance, which is actually required for this particular filter to work properly. So now given this, uh, before we actually start filling in the blocks of our radio, I would like to do a little bit of back of the envelope calculations to be able to see how much gain, et cetera, we do actually need. So here it is. Now, the codec of the WM8731 can handle a signal of one volt maximum. And the amazing thing about these codecs is that there's no distortion at all until you hit the one volt level. So there is no IMD before that. And as I said earlier, that although it's a 24 bit codec, only 16 bits of it are actually usable resolution. So 16 bits mean that there are 65,000 approximately different levels of voltages which it can handle. So your minimum discernible signal is one divided by 65,536, which is about 15 microvolts. But the codec impedance is not 50 ohms. It's actually one kilo ohms, approximately. As a result, our MDS comes to about minus 97 dBm. So that is the minimum signal below which your, your, your signal will actually go into the noise. So that's actually the noise floor, minus 97 dBm. Now, on the other hand, the room temperature noise is about minus 174 decimal uh, dBm per hertz. And given that we are going to use 25 kilohertz of bandwidth, which is about 44 dB, uh, it'll, the noise floor will come up from minus 74 dB to minus, um, you know, minus 130 dB. And let's add another 10 or 15 dB of noise, uh, of, uh, uh, noise figure of the radio itself. So it will come to about minus 120 to minus 115 dB, which means that the gain required between the antenna and the codec is about 23 dB, which is actually fairly low. And we always assume that you know more gain is better, but that's usually not the case. And I will actually go through some of those calculations a little later in this thing. But the, the important thing now is that we have to preserve the linearity of the signal that is, it should have no distortion at all between the antenna and the codec. And one of the key things here is to be able to use mixers which have extremely low distortion or in other words, high dynamic range. And my favorite mixer for this is actually called the KISS mixer done by uh, Chris Trask, which, is very, which works very simply. If you look at the the circuit on the left, which is basically uh, not really a working circuit, but a theoretical circuit, there are two switches, uh, which alternatively ground either of the ends of a transformer, which is being fed by, IF, by the RF input from the other side. So what happens is the IF output keeps flipping at the rate of this, it, all right. These switches are actually alternatively controlled by the VFO. I should have meant, mentioned that, first, sorry. So the VFO keeps switching the polarity of this transformer and the IF output is basically chopped up RF input, which essentially you know, results in the frequencies being mixed together. And what you see on the top right is an implementation of this using a chip which costs less than a dollar, uh, the FSA 3157 and the and what you see down below is actually the implementation of this mixer, 
And I'm proud to say that I could actually solder that this six pin chip, which is about the size of a TO, uh, you know, what's it called? The uh, 239 transistors. And I was able to actually make about three of them, but you know, beyond that, I couldn't really handle it, but it's possible to solder them. Although I have actually now uh, ordered a number of PCBs, general purpose PCBs into which I can actually solder this and then use the PCB itself to make the mixer. And I'll show you how that's being done. So having done that, um, and you know, both these mixers being the KISS mixers, next, let's just go in here. And this is actually a wonderful tool which comes with the book EMRFD, which is called Cascade, in which you can actually write down the name of the blocks on the top row. And then you can fill in the gain of each of the blocks, the noise figure and the OIP3, which is the distortion, uh, figure of merit of each of these stages, press the evaluate button and it will actually give you all the uh, parameters of the receiver's performance by adding them up. Now this tool was actually available on the, yeah, on the CD which came with the experimental methods of RF design, you know, Wes Hayward, Rick Campbell and Bob Larkin's book. But unfortunately in the current run of these books, this, the CD no longer carries the software. And this software is actually particularly very important because uh, the other software, which was all about, you know, designing filters and all that, you could actually do, do that with, with LT Spice. And a lot of people use LT Spice instead of that. But this particular piece of software was missing from anywhere else. So I have actually written a JavaScript version of this, which is hosted on my own website, which is vu2ese.com. And I've given the URL here. So as you can see here, that with the KISS mixer, which has an OIP3 of 23 dBm and an IF amplifier of just you know, 30 dBm, which you can easily do with even a 2 and 2222 uh, IF amplifier. However, the, uh, the audio preamplifier that we are using after the detector also has to be a good one. And we cannot use the ones that we normally use with direct conversion receivers because they overload very easily. And we, we, will, we will now um, also review that new kind of audio preamplifier, which I'm using here, which Wes Hayward has you know, just released about two weeks ago on his own website. Now, before we proceed to the circuit diagram of the SBTX itself, uh, I would just like to show you what happens if we increase the gain anywhere else here in the radio. So you see this audio pre, AF pre here, which has a 15 dB gain. Now let's imagine that we would think that by increasing the gain of this stage, we will be able to get better performance in terms of sensitivity of the, ra of the radio. So you see here, the noise figure is 15.12 dB. Uh, and the IIP3 is 6.24. And when we increase this, you see how we have increased the gain, the noise figure has hardly increased. On the other hand, you will see that the IIP3 has actually degraded down to minus three dBm. So a lot of QRP builders tend to add more gain thinking that the radio is going to be more sensitive, but that's hardly the case. In fact, more the gain, the worse your radio is going to perform, especially with the digital modes. Okay, so uh, we're back to this. And now I'll present you the circuit diagram itself of the radio. And you'll see that the circuit diagram is really, really simple. Uh, there's a low pass filter followed by the KISS mixer, which directly now interfaces to the crystal filter here. And you'll see that this actually is a very innovative thing here because uh, what happens here is that uh, usually the mixer is followed by a post mixer amplifier so that the mixer is given a correct termination, uh, which is not possible with the crystal filter. The crystal filter gives the, the characteristic impedance only at the frequency through which the signal can pass through and at other frequencies, it's highly reactive. And that actually upsets the mixer if this was a diode mixer, but because this is not a diode mixer and instead it's, a, it's, it's, it's an FET mixer. 
it's going to actually give a fairly decent uh, large signal handling capability. And the signal passes through this, through an IF amplifier. There are two IF amplifiers here, back to back. For This is the transmit and this is the receive. And it goes through a second KISS mixer and through an audio preamplifier. Now the audio preamplifier that you see here, and this was the one I was mentioning, is the one which uh, has been designed by Wes Hayward. And this is actually your regular RF feedback amplifier, but adopted to audio frequencies. And it's got a fairly high uh, standing current of about 10 milliamperes through this first transistor. And the second transistor is just an emitter follower uh, to lower the impedance here and also provide a little bit of gain. The, the gain here is about 470 divided by 220. It's just a gain of two here, the voltage gain of two. And this in turn interfaces with our digital board. Uh, this is by the way, the, the implementation of this. This is the low pass filter followed by the KISS mixer, then through the uh, crystal filter here. And these are the two IF amplifiers. And from here it goes into the second KISS mixer. And this is the audio, uh, sorry, this is the KISS mixer and this is the audio preamplifier through which it's passing away to the digital board here. And here is the uh, SI5351 oscillator. And I've basically adopted one of the early Radiono boards, which is used to power the MicroBitX series of transceivers to be able to generate the two clocks here. And this here is the board, uh, the, 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 the digital board, which is basically the heart of this entire system. And this is the WM8731. Uh, you know, it interfaces with the Raspberry Pi. We also have a 5351 on the side and an LM380 for the speaker uh, amplifier. This here is the uh, LM2596, which is a switching regulator, which down converts 12 to five uh, volts. And here we have to add some additional inductors here in order to reduce the noise, which can actually play havoc with the radio circuitry. So uh, up till now, what we have done is that we have looked at the hardware, which is required to get the SDR going, but I had promised you that the software itself is very hackable. And the three things that I thought of while designing the software was that if you can program Arduino, you should be able to also write SDR software. And the way to do that was that the main SDR code of transmit or receive should be able to fit into a single A4 sheet. So I took a lot of effort to see to it that that actually compresses very quickly. Uh, and that you should be able to add more features to it, that it should be learnable, et cetera, et cetera. So, but before we actually launch into the SDR code itself, which will not take a long time for me to explain, is just to get through one particular concept, which is this, uh, that any signal can be viewed or thought of in two ways. So um, what you see on the left is the classic two-tone output of an RF signal. That is, it's, it's, it's an SSB signal with two tones on it. Or you can even you know, think of it as a double sideband PSK31 signal. But either way, it's basically two tones which are next to each other. And what you see on the right is the same signal being read by a spectrum analyzer, where you see those two pips. In fact, you can even see the distortion on the sides of it. Now, both of them represent the same signal. The, oscill the, the oscilloscope's output that you see here visually is plotted with increasing time. That is, the, the spot is moving from left to right in time and it's basically you know, drawing out this uh, waveform as it varies with time. Whereas what you see on the right-hand side is the same signal, but it's now represented where the x-axis is not time, but the frequency. So the frequency is increasing from left to right. So the x-axis is mathematically always called the domain. So the same signal can be represented in time domain or in frequency domain. And mathematically speaking, if you 
digitize a signal in, for, for example, the WM8731, it's giving you samples which are, in, which, which are successively read in increasing order of time. So that's a time domain signal. And in order to convert it to frequency domain, you just use a function called fast Fourier transforms. Let's not bother ourselves with how it works, but just imagine that it works. And we will go on from there to, to figure out how our software will work. So here is the receive process. And in this, uh, what I do here is uh, there's just one more concept that I need to dwell upon for a bit and then we are done, which is this, that when we consider a sine wave, we imagine that this wave is going up and down and up and down and up and down forever, right? Only then we know that it's a sine wave because a sine wave, theoretically speaking, should not have a start and a stop time. Now, when an FFT encounters a signal which is suddenly starting into a sine wave, okay, it will generate a pop because at the beginning, there is a sort of a transient, there's a sort of a spike uh, which sort of starts it from zero onwards. So in order to prevent that spike from coming into your processing, what you do is you, you sort of fudge the FFT into believing that these waves are continuous waves because uh, by actually feeding the FFT with a block from the past, which is also continuation of the sine wave. So what we have to do is we have to always keep taking in an FFT, which, which includes the samples from the previous time the FFT was called. So here, what we do is in step one, uh, each, and this, RT, uh, this RX process is called each time about 1024 new samples of audio are ready from the WM8731's input. So it takes the, the previous 1024 samples, adds the current 1024 samples next to it to produce 2048 samples. And these are actually processed and converted to frequency domain. So that's what is happening here. We first add the samples from the previous round. And then as you will see here, sorry, only the I sample is being taken from the input and the Q sample is being made zero. So this is the big advantage of using a superhead architecture that you don't have to bother with IQ where you're doing a phasing kind of a receiver and the, phase, the phases have to be maintained well because the crystal filter has taken care of that entirely. Okay, so we put this into an array and call, if you can view this right at the bottom of this, uh, the, the FFT execute, uh, function. And now with just calling this one function, it has converted everything from time domain to frequency domain, which means that you can take these outputs and plot them onto your screen. And you will be able to get the spectrum and the waterfall in one shot. So this really simplifies how the SDRs are written. Now, the second thing is that given that the spectrum has been converted uh, this way where you can actually see various signals and this is the signal that you want and the rest have to be filtered out. The way you do the filtering out is very simple. You basically generate the wave, uh, the, the shape of a filter and use that to mask out the other signals. So I'll just show you the code for that. But before that, what we have to do is that now that everything is arranged in the frequencies, Let's imagine that the frequency of our signal is starting from 18 kilohertz and going down to another three kilohertz, that is 21 kilohertz. Now this has to be translated down to zero to three kilohertz. So the way you do it is fairly simple. You just rotate all the frequency bins down. So if you see here in step four, it's a fairly simple piece of uh, code, which is just shifting all the stuff down. And then when you've shifted things down, you basically, you know, sort of rotated everything around. The LSB in case you are at USB or a USB in case of LSB, those also have to be zeroed out so that, you know, that is gone. And finally, you see in step six here, we are multiplying 
a filter with all these frequencies wherein it sort of clips all these filters away. Uh, uh, it, it, it clips all the unwanted signals away that is, you know, higher frequencies, et cetera, and you have your signal ready now. Now this signal is still in frequency domain. So you, exec uh, you execute the FFT once more. The FFT is its own reverse as well. You don't have a, an inverse FFT or a reverse FFT. If you call FFT on a frequency domain, it'll give you time domain. If you call it on time domain, it'll give you frequency domain. So the seventh step is pretty simple. You just execute the FFT for the you know, last time and you get back the time signals. And all you have to do now is to basically send this off into the speaker, which is what we are doing here. So you see that within these eight steps, uh, I have actually commented, commented out the AGC for the time being to make it you know, simpler here. But in just these eight steps, you've been able to actually take the signal, shift it down from 15 kilohertz or, or wherever this signal was centered, eliminate the other side band, filter it out, and then again, play it back into the speaker. And the transmit side actually works equally simply. And this is the actually transmit side where you take the signal coming in from the mic here. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, this one is actually doing a two-tone thing here instead of mic, but you know, consider that this was mic here. Uh, mic input coming here. We have actually, you know, I'm trying to simulate two tones to be able to read the dis distortion output from the transmitter. And then uh, once this is done, we trans we basically convert this to a frequency domain here. And then once we've done that, the next thing we do is we apply the filter to, you know, clip it to three kilohertz or, you know, if it's something else, it can even be even clipped you know, further down, uh, eliminate the other sideband, rotate this to the frequency of the carrier that we wanted to generate the signal at, and then uh, you know, execute uh, FFT once more to get it back into time domain, and then output it to the transmit channel. So you, you see that this entire process is made extremely simple because we do not use the phasing approach to generate SSB, but we use something called as a convolution uh, SDR, where we are basically convolving this in the frequency domain rather than doing it in time domain. And uh, getting here has been actually a fairly long and tedious journey for me. And I've been helped immensely both by Bob Larkin and Phil Kahn. And I've actually mentioned their contributions uh, in my paper, but this speech actually I wanted to, you know, add some more stuff to it than what's then the paper. And I've actually experimented quite a lot. And for example, you'll see that this is actually some of the um, large number of circuits that I've made and remade and tried out before I could actually arrive at the current SBTX system, which is actually working pretty well now. And in addition to being able to adopt it to just these architectures, this also lends itself very well, for example, to VHF and UHF work. Because again, we will not be able to get phasing going properly at VHF, UHF, or for that matter, even direct sampling. And this actually becomes the easiest way to even get there. So uh, I hope that you, know, uh, you all have uh, you know, found something of interest here. Um, it's about, you know, almost 3 a.m. here, so I'm sort of a little, fading a little, and I'm, a little, I'm sorry you know, if I have been tripping over myself um, in being able to explain these things. Uh, but, uh, you know, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Outstanding. Uh, that was... Uh always, as usual, an, an outstanding uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Let's see what uh, we do have for questions. Uh, will you be at the uh, vendor night tonight? Uh, and how many hours do we have that? 
it begins in in uh, two hours. All right, I'll see if I, if I don't fit off. <laughs> if you do, we will understand. A uh, question from Dave New, uh, N8SBE. How do you get 25 kilohertz of bandwidth in the second IF when the first IF has a 15 kilohertz roofing filter? No, um, actually the, the roofing filter is 30 kilohertz. It's, it's not 15 kilohertz. It's, it's three, three, three zero, which is why we have uh, got a crystal filter going at 27 megahertz instead of 11 and 12 megahertz. It's actually a, a roofing filter, which we, which I managed at 30 kilohertz. And that's the design that I was showing you there. Let me see okay. Yeah. And John N zero WL asks, when will this be a kit? Well, I don't know uh, really, uh, you know, um, certainly I think that the, the digital board will be a kit because uh, without that, it'll be difficult for people to assemble those things. Right. So uh, I'm trying to get that out as a circuit board very soon so that, you know, people, once you have that, those in hands, then you can keep, you know, dropping it into your existing radios and start, you know, experimenting with that. So that certainly is a, Kit, but I'm not sure about when anything else will become a kit yet. Okay. Anthony KD8 TFR asks, uh, will you be adding noise reduction? Well, um, it's like this, that um, I will be adding very, I'm not sure of how much I'll be adding there myself because this is already there on GitHub. And there will be, I hope, more people adding more stuff onto this uh, including noise reduction, noise blanking, uh, you know, I mean, all sorts of things. There are things that I understand well, and there are things that I don't understand well. For example, noise blanking, I know how that works. I'm yet to figure out how noise reduction works. So uh, I'm reading up the papers on it, and it's actually a huge uh, education for me, especially the last couple of months. Uh, I hope to be able to, you know, implement at least some of those features. And uh, see, the, the beauty of open source is that, you know, as people keep adding more and more things to it, it just keeps growing in its power. Okay. David Martin asks, is the Raspberry Pi doing all the C++ processing for display and audio? Oh, yes. C, actually, not even C++. I prefer writing in C because it's much simpler to do that. And what I have done here is that even to learn to write graphical user interface programs is very difficult. So I've actually simplified everything down um, to really simple ways of adding new controls. Uh, by controls, I mean, you know, uh, new knobs and switches onto the display itself and be able to tie that to, to your C code. So I've actually simplified it even further uh, than what the GTK, which is a standard, uh, you know, user interface um, programming library of uh, Raspberry Pi does. And it's actually pretty simple to use. You know, if you can just go through the code, you'll see that. JK4ZLE asks, will you be publishing conversions of the micro bit X to single sideband as your one slide indicates? Oh yes, uh, in fact, it's already there. Um, if you go through my paper, uh, the, the URL for it on the GitHub is already there. So I, I mean, it's, it's already there and it's working. I mean, I'm using it these days. Harold Smith asks, what window function do you use with the FFT? Uh, well, actually uh, the one that I'm using now is a Kaiser window, uh, but you know, the, this Blackman window in it as well. So uh, for, for the spectrum display, I'm using Blackman window and I'm using Kaiser windows for uh, window function for you know, doing the uh, filtering of, of the signals themselves. Uh, very interestingly that both these, uh, you know, um, uh, both these functions were actually written by Phil Kahn and I've borrowed it from his open source uh, radio, which is actually really, really interesting radio. And, uh, you know, at this point, I'd just like to mention this, that actually there is a sub receiver in this radio that, that you know, you may have missed, you know, uh, when you saw the visual of it, because the Raspberry Pi has enough power for you to be able to run two versions of radio. So within the 25 kilohertz window, for example, at 7075, 
it could be de- uh, you know um, uh, it could be actually uh, demodulating the by demodulating i mean receiving the ft8 window and passing it on to the wsjtx in the background while on 7050 you might still be you know right chewing with somebody on cw uh, that's question actually from... possible because of the window system yeah Sorry. okay uh, from michael g2ckr what is the sampling frequency for the wolf sun wm8731 codec yeah so that's actually 96000 samples per second um which is why we are able to you know get to an if of about 25 kilohertz so essentially the bandwidth that it's sampling is 48 kilohertz uh will any offerings be available on your website well um uh, you know it's 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 <laughs> my relationship with hf signals is a little complex so essentially okay. i'm not part of hf Sig- signals really you know i am an investor in it and they use my designs but i do not run you know that business on a regular basis and i think it will be some time before we can actually get to hf signals being able to offer this as a kit but definitely the digital board um, certainly so and i hope that you know at least you know others also get into this uh, hf signals is run because of lack of options really you know it's about the time that uh, uh, hendrix kit stopped making the bitex 20 and there was nobody else doing it so we have to actually step in mm-hmm. uh how much does the published modification improve the 2019 dayton antuino how much is lost by not performing this mod uh okay so um it's like this that uh unfortunately the micro bitx does not have performance in hardware which matches the performance that's capable you know with the raspberry pi and the wolfson codec so um in in case of micro bitx micro bitx actually sets the level at which it will operate and for example the the in channel um the in channel dynamic range of micro bitx is just about 70 decibels 70 db it's it's not 90 db so you actually lose about 20 db of headroom uh with uh with the microbitex which is you know an an inherent flaw of microbitex because it was never designed actually to be um an sdr so um the performance the basic performance as radio will remain exactly what the microbitex offers sdr will never be able to i mean no amount of software will ever be able to pull out a signal which has already been lost by the front ends themselves on the other hand there are possibilities of for example with the speech compression which we have not yet implemented in this sdr uh, to be able to sound like a 50 watt radio although it's a 10 watt radio so those are the kind of you know some of those features which will come up which will actually make your uh microbit x work better from w2 ctx ron pfeiffer what os and version are you using on the raspberry pi uh nowadays i mean they've been changing the names of their uh, operating system but i think it's called the raspberry os but it's essentially ubuntu and um, <laughs> i shouldn't be saying this but you can actually check your email on the radio now because it's a full fledged operating system with chrome browser on it so <laughs> uh many thanks for for staying up late and and being with us sharing this uh, these wonderful innovations i appreciate yeah. that i know everybody else in in attendance does Thank as you. well all hope right. to see you tonight Thank you so all right for those gathered for those still waiting with us and i see we have 324 people still in attendance Uh we have one item yet remaining for our afternoon and that is drawing of the main door prize. For this I have before me and you're just going to have to trust me on this uh a spreadsheet of all the names of those who have registered and paid the registration fee and with each
And with each uh, name, there is a random function generator associated. And I can prime that a number of times and get extremely random. And having done so, I now then place all of these names in order and sort them. And the one with the lowest number will be our grand prize winner, the ICOM IC705. And with that, we have an additional donation from Mike Yellow, uh, a 3D printed frame, a protective frame that is a companion piece, which he, he has uh, built and donated. So we now sort based on this random number generator. And let's see who our winner for the door prize, grand prize mm -hmm. of FDA, FDIM 2021. And the answer is Harry Jones, K9DXA is our winner. So congratulations to Harry. Uh, the ICOM IC705 will go out in the mail next week and congratulations. So thank you everyone for being part of this, this long day. A lot of us have been sitting for a long time. A lot of us could use a nap. I know I could. <laughs> uh, so meet back here in uh, two hours. I've sent out the link to the evening uh, vendor night, club night, meet the speaker night. It's going to be a meeting format as opposed to a webinar format. So there will be much more interaction between uh, everybody. So meet back then and uh, we will have a good evening. So thanks all. And uh, if nothing else, let's meet in Fairborn next year. Did you send that out by email, um, Dave? Um, I will send, I will send, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I sent the, the, meet, the link for tonight's meeting out in the email. It's at the bottom, at the bottom of the page. Which, when, which, when was that one? Uh, it was the one I sent out on Sunday. So there were two links, two separate events. Uh, make sure I've got it. I'll just resend the email to you, Dino. Yeah, would you please? Because I seem to have misplaced it somehow. Yeah, Thank anybody you. else who doesn't have it, just email me and I will I will resend all the information as needed. Send it to me as well. This is Jerry. Okay. And so that's confirmed this will be in two hours? Two hours. Okay.